establish. First, thank you for coming uh, to these hearings, which are part of the overall work of the Landmark Land Use Committee of Community Board 2 in Brooklyn. Uh, this is April 19th, uh, 2023. And we will first, we'll have, we have on schedule first a hearing uh, regarding 280, uh, yeah, yes, 280 uh, Bergen Street, a Eula hearing. We'll have a non Eula hearing uh, after the words for 589 Fulton, Fulton Street. Now, <clears throat> Well, how we're going to be doing this, and again, I thank uh, Thomas, Thomas who, Thomas, for uh, taking the minutes of this one. Uh, Thomas, are you ready to take minutes? Uh, yes, I presume. Yes. Oh, okay. There you go. All right, and you're ready. All right. Okay, so just to make sure that you're ready, so we can, uh, we'll be when I hit the uh, button, we'll proceed. Okay, so uh, again. The way these things work now for these hearings is that uh, first each presenters will present for each of their uh, topics. Now, the way the rules work now is that the committee members and board members will not participate in the hearing, will not be asking questions in the hearing. I'll just guide things along. The public is willing, is invited and may wish to speak after the presentation of the uh, of each one of the items that from the presenters. However, I, at this point, we will only limit the uh, amount of each person is two minutes per person from the public. So make sure it's understood. If you believe that you have been given something special, please inform me. Otherwise, it will be two minutes per person. Uh, and I think we, now after we've done the hearings, then we'll, we'll assume we'll start the regular committee meeting and we do our usual bit. And then during the meeting, we'll make the, uh, the committee members and board members will be free to speak and ask questions about the uh, what was presented at the hearings, and then we'll each will vote on each of the, those items, and then we'll have the other items that we have as well as part of the uh, our schedule. So with that, I guess we'll let's get started. On uh, we'll start in hearing number one. Uh, this is for two eighty Bergen Street. And it's a Euler C230162 ZSK, also CEQR 22 DCP, uh, yes, 22 DCP 149K. Uh, and it, this is in regarding oh, for, um, at two, uh, yes, 280 Bergen Street. And what basically what they're looking at on two for 280 Bergen Street. Is the replacement of hundred of over one hundred sixty um, parking spaces at that site, which would be replaced by a garden area for a building uh, that's going to be built at that location. Uh, you know, it'll be a new building for uh, for a garden area for a building which will be for a uh, residential as well as commercial uses. Uh, yes, and it's going to be a, a, yeah, I'm just trying to keep it as minimal as possible. Uh, we have a will be commercial and residential and it'll be at that location uh, in place of the parking area that we have at this time. Uh, so I guess we can start with uh, 280 uh, Bergen Street, and the presenters are, are free to present at this time. Go ahead. All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, can you hear me? Dan Eggers, land use attorney at Greenberg Chard. Yes, I can hear you. Thank Excellent. you. you can Good proceed. to be with you again. And I'm joined by Rich Dillon representing ownership. This application is being made at the request of this board and council member Ressler, as, as you might recall. 
It's uh, being made by an affiliate of the Ulano Corporation, and it's for a special permit pursuant to Section 74533 of the zoning resolution to waive the parking requirements of ZR 2523 in proposed mixed use developments on a portion of the block bounded by Nevin Street, Third Avenue, Birkin Street, and Wyckoff Street in Boreham Hill, which is shown here. As you recall, this was subject of a rezoning that was approved last year, which rezoned- Mr. Eggers? Yes. Go ahead and share screen, please. Oh, I thought it was already up. Sorry. Um, from before. There we go. Can you see my screen now? Yes, that looks great. Thanks. Right. Go ahead. All right. I, you didn't you didn't miss much. I had just begun my my spiel. <laughs> okay. Visuals. And you've seen and you've seen this before, um, but I do want to refresh recollections. So as you recall, this was subject of a rezoning that was approved last year, which rezoned the development sites mid-block from M12 to R7A. The block's third avenue frontage was rezoned in a separate application earlier last year from an M12 district to an R7D C24 district, and that's shown in blue. When, we're, when we were before you for the rezoning, this board and council member wrestler expressed concern that given the site's proximity to mass transit, the development should not need required parking. We originally proposed 125 parking spaces. So in response to this concern, we've applied for this special permit to waive the development's parking requirement, which is why we're before you tonight. Again, much of what I'm going to show you, uh, you saw last year, but I, I do want to refresh recollections and there may be some new people on the board. This shows our development site and the site of the Third Avenue rezoning. This uh, shows the lots that are owned by Ulano in yellow, which total 50,700 square feet. They're improved with the one and two story buildings in the photo that I just showed you. Ulano also leases lots from the city totaling about 20,000 square feet controlled by HPD pursuant to a 1973 lease, which are shown in pink. These parcels are used for accessory parking. Ulano's lease runs through 2063, but as part of the approval of the rezoning application last year, Ulano agreed to surrender its lease as of June 30th, 2024. This would facilitate uh, housing proposals on HPD by on, on those lots. Here are project area photographs, again from Third Avenue and Bergen Street. It's on uh, Bergen Street looking west, development site on the left. It's photos of the Wyckoff Street frontage of the development site. On Wyckoff Street looking east now, you see the HPD owned lot. And again, the uh, tax map to uh, orient us. As mentioned, the approved rezoning eliminated uh, the remainder of the M12 district and mapped an R7A district with MIH in its place, which is shown here. A portion of the project is in the R7D C24 district mapped under the separate Third Avenue rezoning. The R7D district with MIH allows up to 5.6 FAR and the R7A with MIH allows up to 4.6 FAR. And here are illustrative renderings that show the preliminary design of the project. This is on Bergen Street looking east, Bergen Street looking west, Wyckoff Street. And here are our illustrative massings that show the maximum size buildings that could be constructed in the mid block as of right now. The R7A district with MIH sets a maximum base height of 75 feet, at which height a 15 foot setback is required from the narrow streets, and there's a maximum building height of 95 feet or nine stories. The development site could be redeveloped with four new buildings, a nine story building on Bergen Street containing about 250 dwelling units, as well as ground floor retail and community facility uses, smaller nine story building you see here fronting on Wyckoff with about 45 units, and two to three, two three to five story townhouse buildings, one on each side of the block's uh, R6B district would contain up to three to five units each. 
Altogether, the contemplated development would have approximately 238,000 square feet of floor area, including by about 5,000 square feet of commercial space and 5,000 square feet of community facility floor space and 228,000 square feet of residential floor area. For the community benefits agreement entered into for the approval of the rezoning, good faith efforts must be made to lease the commercial space to a fresh food store and the community facility space to urgent care or doctor's offices, senior services, a school, child care, or educational uses. The community benefits agreement also requires that in addition to the affordable housing required by MIH option one, five additional affordable housing units be provided at 80% AMI. As mentioned, this board and council member expressed concern that given the site's proximity to mass transit, the development should not need required parking. We originally proposed 125 spaces. In response, we applied for this special permit to waive the parking requirement, which is now before you as part of Euler. Without this waiver, the parking would be provided on the ground floor, including in a one-story portion extending into the rear yard, which is what we showed you last year, totaling about 18,000 square feet. As you can see here, and as the chair mentioned in the introduction, if the parking is removed, it is contemplated it would be replaced with an about 13,000 square foot rear yard garden for building residents, that's shown in green, and about 5,000 square feet within the building would be reallocated to residential amenity and mechanical spaces. Further, as you probably recall, during the rezoning process, Council Member Ressler convened multiple meetings of stakeholders including members of this board, Wyckoff Gardens, and the president of the Borum Hill Association. And in response to comments from these stakeholders to improve the development's relation to the uh, lower rise buildings to the west, the applicant agreed to increase setbacks on the western edge of the proposed development, which was memorialized in the community benefits agreement, which I'm, I'm now going to show you. And some of you may have seen this last year, but I wanted to show you the results of those stakeholder meetings. This shows the development setting back from the development site's western lot line, the bottom version, on Bergen Street above the fourth floor, 20 feet at floors five to seven, and floors eight and nine setting back an additional 10 feet for a total setback of 30 feet. It was originally proposed to be 10 feet. In addition, this shows a portion of the development on Wyckoff flipping its core to its eastern portion to reduce the height in its western portion. Again, we're only before you tonight regarding uh, the waiver of the site's parking requirement that you and the council member requested, but we wanted to show you the entire contemplated project once more so you could see the changes that occurred during the Euler process after we were before you um, almost a year ago. And um, thank you uh, for your time. Good to see you again. And uh, that's, that's it. Thank you very much, Ms. Dick. At this point, uh, I will open the floor to any of the members of the public that wishes to speak or open the digital floor, so to speak. Vishnu Reddy, 11201. <clears throat> Hi, all. Uh, I'm a resident of Community District 2, and I live a few blocks away from the site that we're discussing. Um, I just wanted to express my wholehearted support for waiving the parking requirements as a community. We should do more to discourage more parking from being built and waiving this parking requirement would be a clear win for the community. And I also want to thank the council member and the developers for taking the initiative to do this. And uh, those are all my comments. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Reddy. Uh, next Mr. Question. Gordon, this is John Do. I have a question. No question. Okay. Or, yes, uh, as I said earlier, we'll be doing all the questions. Chair Gordon, John the, John Dew may be yeah. acknowledged during this this portion. He's a member of the public. That is correct. Thank you, Taya. Right. Hello, John. How are you, young lady? <laughs> In any event, I don't want to disturb your meeting. Can I go along with my question, Mr. Gordon? Okay. Okay. Uh, there are a couple of items, actually. Uh, in terms of the public transportation, is the closest subway station that you referred to ADA compliant? That's the first question. The second question regards 
the AMI. Can you provide the actual rent numbers that are associated with that 80% of AMI that the community is expected to accommodate? And whether there has been any discussion of the gentrification in the community uh, and all of New York City that has been caused by the AMI that the city applies to all of these buildings. And lastly, for the parking that is going to be replaced with a park. I happen to have a different perspective on parking because of all of the city policies that have removed parking spots from all of the communities and the increased population in the city of New York. There is not an overall plan that discusses what happens when you remove parking spots from a community. So its intended purpose is not being met because cars now have to ride blocks and blocks and blocks extra in order to find parking that's not conveniently located near the residential property. So if you could just address those issues, I'd be greatly appreciative. Thank you. Sure, and I'll, I'll do the best I can. I, I do not have at hand information as to the ADA accessibility of the nearest subway station, but um, perhaps someone else does, or if not, we can look into that and, and get back to you. And as well, for I happen to know it's not ADA okay. accessible. Okay. Uh, I'm thanks. giving everybody an opportunity to understand that the pro that the programs for transportation in New York City are not adequate. They are very piecemeal and they have adverse impacts on the community. Sure. Um, as for AMIs, uh, the these numbers are, are from last year. I don't have the updated figures, but uh, as set by um, HPD and, and the formula at 60% AMI, a one bedroom would rent for 1500 a month, a two bedroom for 1800 and a three bedroom for uh, for 2000 a month. But what did you, I thought you said 80% AMI. That's the 60% that is average under MIH option one. The 80% AMI uh, that would apply to those additional units would be $2,000 a month for a one bedroom, $2,400 for a two bedroom, and $2,700 for a three bedroom. Thank you. And, and the park. I, I, right. And for your third question, I, I, I remembered. Um, we haven't done a, a detailed study as to the, the on street parking availability, but you know, while this was required under the community benefits agreement and asked for by the community board and the council member, the developer team, if I can speak for them, we we see the the benefit in not having required parking here um, from an environmental standpoint, from um from reducing uh, congestion and from you know just moving away towards dependence on automobiles in this in this day and age given what's going on in the world. So I want to I want to put that out there. I, and I, I understand Thank even you, if the Sanders. community okay we, next, we, I see. we have grown since last year in terms of the information that we understand impacts the community. So thank you for that. You're welcome. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, I see one other person, Sean McLaughlin. Hi, folks. Uh, I just wanted to uh, mostly echo the points that Vishnu had made earlier. Uh, I uh, live on Burger Street, I'm a member of the community, uh, and I think that this uh, development uh, is very close to a lot of great transit options uh, and that uh, re removing the parking requirement would enable uh, prevent some congestion on our streets and enable a lot more folks who don't necessarily need to use uh, a car to get around New York City, uh, opportunity to live in a place that's perhaps more affordable for them. So um, support the amendment. Uh, those are my thoughts. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. McLaughlin. I do not see any other um, um, members I, of the public. I have my hand up. Oh, sorry. Oh. A member to of voting board, board okay. members that I do not speak during public hearings. Thank you. Apologies. All right. So, yeah, we'll hold. We're gonna we'll hold. We're, we're gonna do the, your part on the in the meeting itself. We're still in the hearing section, so we have to uh, just hold on and uh, hold your comments until we get to the uh, meeting section of our 
work being done. I just want to add before we uh, conclude the hearing, uh, as a one of the things they give us the, uh, I would say the, I guess what we should be looking for as part of the application. And what we should be looking for is to make sure that there is no undue uh, pressures on the, on pedestrians or on the on transit or on the traffic. Uh, we should be looking. So these are things that we should be looking at as well. And no, yeah, of course, no uh, undue uh, problem on traffic congestion. So these are things that we should be that the board will be looking at as part of the application. Again, I do not see any further uh, members of the public uh, who wish to speak on to, uh, 280 Bergen Street. So at this time, uh, which is 626 p.m., I will be closing the hearing for uh, 280 Bergen Street. We'll now proceed to the second hearing, uh, also at 626 p.m., uh, it's the second hearing, and this is for 589 uh, Fulton Street. Uh, just a moment as I get my uh, bearings. Give me a second. Here we go. Yes, and this is a curb cut authorization for 589 uh, Bergen Street. It's not a. It's a non Euler, uh, and it's number N two three zero two three seven. Z A K C E Q R 23 D C P 030 K. Uh, and this just reminds me of uh, the applicant for both the first hearing and the second hearing uh, basically are going to be matters that are going to the uh, Department of City Planning. Uh, this is an application on up to this one uh, for uh, 589 Fulton Street which is a curb cut uh, at that sort of semi-triangular location at which is located right at, right across, let's say from LIU uh, and the, uh, yeah, basically it's going to be on the Calva Avenue, Flatbush Avenue extension, Fulton Street, and a little bit of uh, Bond Street. And there's a request to build a curb cut on the south side of the Calb Avenue. And yes, again, and we're, what, what they wanna look for it on this one is that it doesn't interfere with the traffic. It doesn't interfere with uh, pedestrian use. Uh, it doesn't interfere with public transit. Uh, and it doesn't, it, yeah, and these are things that we'll be looking for so that it will have a, hopefully a smooth sailing on this if it's uh, approved. Uh, presenter for 589 Fulton Street, you can go ahead. Hi, everyone. Uh, Nick Williams from Freed Frank, representing the applicant team. Um, I'm here with uh, Adam Gottlieb, uh, representing the development team, and then Carlos Cardozo from BBB Architecture, uh, who's going to be sharing a presentation. Uh, so I don't know if he needs to be given access to. Okay, a little louder, please. <laughs> Apologies, is that better? Yes, much better. Go ahead. Mr. Um, Cardozo, I, you should be able to share screen. Go ahead. I will. Can everybody see it? It's uh, loading. Oh, there, there, there we goes. go. Okay. There it is. Great. So uh, before we get into describing the project, I'm going to turn it over to Adam Gottlieb to briefly introduce um, the project and the development team. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Adam Gottlieb with the Wickoff Group. Um, we are developing this this project. Uh, really, really excited to take what's what's uh, kind of been a, a long process in the corner of Fulton and Flatbush, uh, and hopefully turn it into what you see on the screen pretty soon, as you may be aware, because we're all obviously quite quite local. Um, we're in the foundation phase right now and moving forward pretty well. Um, Really, the main reason we're here uh, is is a is a technical nuance in the zoning code. Um, what we're what we're here to ask for is a is a curb cut authorization. Um, and really, what we presented is is what, what we feel is um, really the best benefit for the community. And, and what we are 
going forth as of right here is a, is a pretty tall building. It's 52 stories, 591 units, 30% of which is uh, designated as affordable uh, for New York uh, by the program. And uh, because of that building, there is a significant amount of loading and trash that will come out. And, and really because of the zoning, there is no curb cut available. Um, we'll kind of walk you through the, the, the different areas and, and, and really the reasons why we arrived at, at the design we did. Um, but really, we're here to ask for that curb cut because we think it's the best thing for the neighborhood. Um, and uh, yeah, with that, uh, I'm trying to keep you too long tonight, but we're really excited about it. I'm going to turn it over to uh, back to Nick and then to Carlos with uh, Fire Bell. Mm -hmm. All right. Thanks, Adam. Uh, next slide, Carlos. Yeah. There you go. Right. Oh no. There we go. That's fine. Um, so before I turn it over to Carlos, the architect, to walk through the sort of the site planning and the building and all the features, this is a brief overview of the zoning uh, situation and the site location. Um, so it's as was referred to about how he believed in giving blacks the right. Um, so it's it's an irregular shaped lot uh, bounded by Flatbush. Fulton, uh, a short piece of Bond Street that's contiguous with Alby Square and DeKalb Avenue. Um, the applicant owns lot 14 and lot 30 on this zoning lot. Lots 26 and 28 at the mid block are the Dwayne Reed on Fulton Street. Um, the western lot, lot 30, will be developed with a, a one story retail building. Um, and the majority of the development on the site will be on lot 14. Uh, it's in the C6. 4.5 district in downtown Brooklyn in the Fulton Mall corridor um, has a as a right FAR of 12 uh, and as Adam said there's affordable housing associated with the project and the reason we're here and we'll get into more of the technical details later is that um, there are no curb cuts allowed as of right on this block uh, the project that's being developed as of right is a, a fairly large residential building that has significant needs for residential moves, waste collection, and deliveries. And so there's a, a desire to accommodate those activities on site and to have a curb cut for loading activities for that purpose. So that's what we're talking about tonight. Um, so I'll pass it to Carlos to, to uh, present the project. Carlos, you're on mute. All right, thank you, Nick. So a little bit about the project to Nick's point and Adam's before. Um, as you see here, some statistics and metrics. It's a 52-story building, 591 units, of which 178 are affordable, but total gross square footage of about 606,000 gross square feet, of which 25,000 approximately are retail. You see here the uh, little vignette or key plan of the how it looks on from Fulton, Flatbush, and DeKalb Avenue. And obviously in a building that is that has 591 units, the next point before, you're going to have quite a bit of waste management. You're going to have deliveries, both retail and on the residential side, as well as just overall maintenance of the building per se coming in. So those statistics obviously requires a curb cut for a loading dock because the best thing here to not affect the neighborhood is to get these trucks off the street, whether they be delivery trucks or whatnot, and into our building. And to give you a little bit of, and let me see if I can go to the next slide here, a little bit of context to our building and to a design. Here is the elevation on Fulton Street. As you can see here, our residential entry is off to the west side here or the left side on the screen. The ground floor will be all retail. Above that is two floors of amenity and then a podium comprised of a roof deck. The tower then rises from above that, as you see here on the white little vignette on the key plan. As we turn the corner from Fulton onto Flatbush, onto the east side, you see the continuation of the retail spaces here, continues down Flatbush Avenue. The existing subway station that's there will stay there and will be reactivated upon completion of the project. And the same program continues on Flatbush Avenue. Now, 
as we head and turn towards decap, here is this elevation. And it's just to put it a little bit of into perspective and so everybody understands, that's this little piece of the elevation. What you're seeing here ghosted out is the continuation of Flatbush. So we didn't want people to think that this is a wide elevation here. Our buildings actually has a small elevation. And then um, the existing building adjacent to it, which is remaining there. So our request for the curb cut and for which leads to the loading dock is on Decab Avenue on this location. Obviously, Flatbush is pretty congested and pretty heavily trafficked, as well as Fulton Street. And this became the more prominent location, made the most sense to locate the loading dock. It also has the retail there and has a secondary exit entrance for the residential. But this is probably best explained. Uh, hold on one second. Wow. Sorry, my computer. Here we go. On plan is the loading dock. In, the, in other words, this loading dock that we are accommodating here can accommodate two trucks, 30 footers, which we feel is necessary. And we have done the studies, the traffic studies, as well as the waste management studies, which is part of, I believe, an exhibit that we have that Nick can explain that really supports why we need this loading dock to be this size. And it's really to accommodate everything we said from waste management, deliveries, be it retail or e-commerce and every day that we get deliveries, so forth and so on, and move ins and move outs. So one thing to keep into perspective is this, part of the study illustrates that for a period of about minimum two to three hours a day, there will be trucks in that loading dock. If we were not to have a curb cut here or create a loading dock, a loading dock, these trucks would be probably lined up on the street, which would be a nonsense nuisance to the community and obviously um, impede traffic and pedestrians as well. So best way to really see this is through these photographs that we've rendered our building next to the existing building. This is the corner of Flatbush and Decab. Here is the proposed loading dock that you see. Um, the next slide really gives you a good perspective from the eastern side looking towards the west side of the street, DCAB, a one-way street. The bike lane, the cars parked, and obviously to the left here is the loading dock. The two trucks will be, up to two trucks will be in this loaded, uh, loading dock, fully engaged in the loading dock. They will not be sticking out onto the sidewalk. We made sure to design it that way, but it kind of puts into perspective why we're doing what we're doing and for the request tonight to keep the streets uncongested. On the next slide here shows the study of the trucks maneuvering, how we can accommodate the 30 foot truck, how they would maneuver their way into the loading dock and then stay there while whatever activities they need to do get executed. Another component we did is to illustrate to you other trucks that could be accommodated from whether it's a waste truck, moving truck, delivery trucks that would be in this area. And again, probably two to three hours on a daily basis, these loading docks will be fully um, occupied until the activity is executed. And on that note, I will turn it back to Nick to talk more about the uh, zoning details. Thank you, Carlos. Uh, mm -hmm. I'll speak to the technical uh, requirements and, and why we're in front of you tonight. Um, so on these two maps are on the left side, an, an excerpt from the zoning map, which shows the general zoning overlay. And the site is at the center. You can see the sort of the irregular shape south of, east of Albee Square um, in the downtown Brooklyn district. On the right hand side is an excerpt from the downtown Brooklyn zoning text. And you can see in the center this dashed line around the full border of the zoning lot. And what that means is that this site is not allowed to have any curb cuts for parking or loading as of right. Instead, what the text provides is that for if a project, uh, if it's desirable for a project to have a curb cut, there's a requirement to go to the city planning commission for an authorization uh, so that there can, and, and the reason behind this is so that the city could assure that there is uh, sort of uh, 
thoughtful location of the curb cut uh, to accommodate the location here. Um, I, I should say that uh, this also means that the parking requirement and loading requirements under zoning for the project are waived and there's no parking that's proposed as part of this project. Um, as Carlos said, this is a large building. There is a lot of truck activity associated with the operations of the building, both from residential moves, on-site waste collection, deliveries. And so it's really desirable and we think beneficial to the neighborhood to accommodate that loading activity on site, which is why we propose to locate that on decals. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is an excerpt from our application package. This is a site plan that will be approved that shows the location of the curb cut, uh, if approved. And this will go to, to DOB and they'll, um, well, they'll confirm that the curb cut is located where it has been approved to be. At the bottom of the page, you can see the findings that the City Planning Commission is required to make. Uh, so in order to grant this authorization, they need to find that the curb cut will not unduly inhibit surface traffic or result in conflict between pedestrian and vehicular cir circulation, and that it will result in a good overall site plan. Uh, and it's important to note that the, the word unduly, um, a any loading activities are going to impact uh, traffic and vehicular circulation and pedestrian circulation. Uh, and it's, it's our view that accommodating those activities on site as opposed to curbside uh, greatly reduces the impact to vehicular traffic and pedestrian traffic. Uh, and so that is what the proposal is. Uh, and it results in a good overall site plan by contributing to the operational efficiency of the building, uh, including allowing for, again, on site waste collection rather than curbside waste collection. So that is our proposal. Um, this is not a ULERP action, which means it doesn't go to the borough president and doesn't go to the city council. From a process perspective, after the community board's review period is over, this, is, this goes back to the city planning commission who will uh, make a decision at a, a review session um, at some time in the month of May. We look forward to uh, answering any questions uh, you might have about the project and thank you very much for your time. Carlton, you're on mute. Okay, I don't think that Carlton, I think Carlton's having technical difficulties. So why don't we open up the floor while he's working that out to public members who want to make a comment. Um, let's see. Taya, if you can help me, I, don't, I can't see everybody. I don't currently see any members of the public with their hands raised. Reminder that board members will have their discussion during the committee meeting that immediately following the hearing. Members of the, oh, I see, uh, yes, Mr. Jared Grimm from DBP would like to speak. Everyone's having a microphone issues. Mr. Graham, we can't hear you. you, so, you there me? you go. Great. Uh, dear, dear Chair Gordon and members of Community Board 2, my name is Jared Grimm. Uh, I'm a Vice President of Real Estate and Economic Development at the Downtown Brooklyn Partnership. On behalf of the partnership, I would like to express our strong support for the proposed curb cut authorization along DeKalb Avenue for 589 Fulton Street. The proposed 52-story tower will include over 590 apartments, including over 170 affordable units, as well as incorporating a subway entrance along Flatbush Avenue for the Decalb Avenue BQR lines. The new development includes over 25,000 square feet of retail space with frontage along Fulton Street and Flatbush Avenue. 589 Fulton will serve as a new anchor and gateway into downtown Brooklyn and the Fulton Mall shopping corridor. 
the upgraded ground floor retail will further enliven and activate one of the most trafficked retail and shopping transit corridors in Brooklyn. The building will thoughtfully manage building operations, whether large deliveries or trash mitigation by incorporating a loading dock and related curb cut, as opposed to using sidewalk for trash disposal okay. and truck parking. Fulton Street is a prime retail destination, heavily trafficked by pedestrians and MTA bus lines, while Flatbush Avenue is a very busy six lane vehicular street connecting the Manhattan Bridge to central Brooklyn. A curb cut and loading dock along Decalb Avenue provides the building with the best option to handle its building operations. Five and Fulton Street uh, will uncertainly um, enhance the downtown Brooklyn community by adding much needed housing and upgraded retail to a transit rich location. The proposed curb cut along Decalb uh, results in a good overall site plan. It will not duly, unduly inhibit, inhibit surface traffic yeah. or cause conflict between pedestrians and vehicular circulation. We urge you to support this application. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Gross. Okay, we're all right, I'm able to speak again. Uh, are there any other uh, members of the public? And uh, oh, I should just yes. say, by the way, thank you. We received, uh, just for the record, uh, a copy of the letter that you sent has been uh, forwarded to all to members of the committee, and the board has received your letter. And thank you very much for your uh, interest. Okay, are there any other members of the public that wish to speak on uh, 589? Uh, um, yes, um, my name is Regina Robinson. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, go ahead. Hi, um, I have a question about how this is going to be managed because I'm a resident um, not too far away from this and that, that intersection is still actually extremely busy. Um, now, they propose that it will, you know, be occupied two to three hours a day. Um, I understand the logistics of it, but um, I mean, the placement of it, but um, I don't think two or three hours is an accurate assessment of how long that will, that those spaces will actually be occupied coming in and out of trucks and be disrupted to the tra lanes of traffic and the buses that will be coming down that lane, that particular street. Sure, sure. Given the volume, the, given the size, the given the size of the yeah. part, proposed part, um, building and the re retail space there. If the presenters so wish So are there that going to be question? particular hours that it's restricted to where the, what's been, the needs of the building are gonna be handled at, you know, hours that are after rush hour or something because that's going to be disruptive because to that's really going to be disruptive with that the, the amount of traffic that's coming down the that street okay well all right well, first i'll leave it to the uh presenters to answer the question if they can yeah sure, thank nick, you nick, uh, nick also well, you want to take it nick go ahead you, you can take you can go ahead yeah everybody um, so just in response, this is a very good question. I mean, ultimately, we we felt that uh, the loading dock actually will, will aid in that congestion more than anything else by getting those trucks off the street. Um, without the dock, this 591 unit building uh, would have trucks staged along the street side and the curbside with no other alternative to actually get furniture in and out for movement, et cetera. Um, so I, I think you're probably right. I mean, the 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 suggestion that the dock itself will be occupied for two to three hours a day, maybe longer. Um, in terms of our operations, we, we plan, uh, we always plan our best and, uh, you know, this building won't be completed until 2020 and 2025, um, but, but ultimately move-ins and move-outs, which will have trucks sitting in that loading dock the longest. Um, those are almost always restricted to the, between the hours of nine and four. Um, the elevators and the use of elevators and just building operations wouldn't, wouldn't permit them to happen after hours, uh, generally speaking. And then the trash pickup is something we have a little bit less control over, uh, as you know, and the other deliveries are, are, are likely to happen, uh, hopefully during during that daytime window where the traffic is less, not during the rush hour timeframes. Um, but again, I, I think it goes back to our, our goal really is to get those trucks off the street and out of the congestion, um, knowing that sure, if they have to back in, it may cause, uh, they may have to, you know, uh, stop a bus for the, the, the 
15 seconds it takes to back in, but then ultimately that that's gone. And if, if you recall that uh, the, the image of, of of how tight DeKalb is back there with the single lane, the bike uh, juniors and and the bus lane, um, we really felt it best to make sure those those trucks are are not staged there. And any other uh, comments from the well, first any other from the uh, presenters? Do you have anything else you wish to add? We think that's uh, okay. I guess we thank you for you uh, at, for answering the question. Uh, are there any other uh, members of the public that wish to uh, be heard? Can you hear me, Mr. Gordon? Yes. Go ahead, Mr. D. Yes. Um, you spoke to the number of residents that are expected to occupy that building. Can you speak to how much activity the actual residents will bring to that sidewalk? And can you talk about the number of buses that pass this particular uh, location and what the impact of that loading zone might be on those passing buses? I think as Adam spoke to, um, the, the goal of the curb cut is to move the truck traffic off of the street to minimize impacts to the buses. Uh, I don't have detail in front of me on the level of bus activity on that street. Um, but in, in doing the site planning for this project, um, there were studies done of the uh, traffic patterns on the surrounding streets, both pedestrian, bicycle, vehicular, and bus. Uh, and it was concluded that DeKalb was the street that would be least impacted by a curb cut and by the loading activity here. Um, so there was a lot of thought that was given to that. Um, sorry, for you. your first question was about the number of the um, the number of new residents and the potential impacts on the pedestrian activity. On that point, I would say the the main entrance, uh, if you can recall from the ground floor plan, the primary residential entrance is off of Fulton Street. The expectation is that the, that the majority of residents would be entering and exiting the building off of Fulton Street rather than off of DeKalb. And have you done an overall impact study that speaks to all of the issues that occur at that particular intersection, which is an extremely busy intersection with transportation and pedestrian traffic? throughout the course of the average day? There was an environmental assessment statement prepared in connection with the application that included a detailed traffic study. Was that shared with the community board? Uh, it, 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 it's a public document. If there's not a copy uh, that's been shared, we can make that available. Could you please? Thank you. Mr. Gordon, I think I'm done for right now. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Dip. Okay. Oh, I'll add that I think there's one bus line on the decal, and I think there's four bus lines on the Fulton Street side. So there's buses, <laughs> you know, going back and forth at that uh, location. All right. Are there any other um, questions or from the, or comments from the public? Okay, Gordon, I don't see I, any. Okay, thank you. Okay, at 6.54 p.m., I'm now closing the hearing for 589 Fulton Street. And now we will begin. I will first of all just say thank you, uh, Thomas, for taking the minutes uh, for, the, you know, on these, on, for this matter. And Thank you, uh, board members who are not on my committee uh, who, for coming and participating to provide forums so that we could get this in. Uh, you're welcome, those board members who are not on my committee are welcome to say, and you're even welcome to participate, although I can't, have, you won't be able to vote. But other than that, you're welcome to stick around or you know, you're free to go if you, you have to, anything else that you have to do, but thank you anyway. Okay, at this time, 
uh, at 6.55 p.m. We're starting the our meeting of the Landmark Land Use Committee for Community Board 2, uh, Brooklyn. Uh, again, uh, I think that Dorothy Kostarfin is our co-chair. Uh, Karen, I don't know, I hadn't seen, is Karen, Karen in? I didn't see, oh, there you go. All right, thank you, Karen. Okay, great. So Karen's ready uh, to pick up on it. Karen Johnson's our secretary, both Daughtry and Karen have been working very hard uh, to provide help on getting these things done. And thank you very much. Uh, at this time, uh, I guess first we'll ask for a um, uh, for the agenda. I guess if people have seen the agenda, if there's no uh, objection, I'd like to have the agenda adopted. Motion to approve the agenda. Thank you. And if we have a second. Second. Uh, if not, I'll, okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Okay. And the uh, agenda has been adopted. Thank you. And also the uh, minutes. Uh, thank you for the March meeting. Uh, I thank you, Karen, for doing it. Uh, there was a lot of work on that one. Uh, if, there any, if there's no objection, I'd like to have the minutes for the March meeting of Landmarks Land Use uh, adopted. Uh, so okay, moved. I guess. Okay, thank you, uh, Daughtry, and I'll second it just to keep things moving. Okay, so the minutes uh, from the March meeting have been adopted, and uh, thank you for both. Thank, thank all for for your help on these matters. Okay, so next now we'll go right over to a vote on. 280 uh, Bergen Street. I'm sorry, Mr. Gordon, before uh, we do that, there's a public comment yeah. period on the agenda. So just make sure. Oh, right. Yes, anyone... thank you. Yes, right. I'm glad you reminded me. Yes, in fact, I had something in mind on that one as well. Uh, yes, we have the public comment on the agenda. Um, in fact, actually, this, that reminds me of something that I wanted to bring up on the uh, public comment on the agenda. I know that there was a um, some concern from the Clinton Hill uh, community groups uh, concerning uh, one Cambridge place uh, because they didn't hear from the presenter. Uh, and I just wanted to state that we try not to uh, delay any votes on the uh, certificates of appropriateness. Uh, we would prefer. We try to get them in because they're, we're, we're only given a limited amount of time by the Landmark Preservation Commission on uh, these matters. So I know there was some concern on that matter. We'll try to do our best that we can do, uh, even if they have not consulted with the uh, community group. Uh, but we will also take that into consideration as well. Uh, I've sp okay, so I've spoken on that little point. Are there any other comments other than that, and than that uh, concerning the agenda. Hearing none, then let's get over to the uh, to the votes on the uh, matters that we did for the hearing. Uh, we had we have our first one is uh, yep, yeah, two eighty Bevan Street. I mean two eighty uh, Bergen Street. And uh, let's. Are there any comments or questions from committee members and board members on 280 uh, Bergen Street? Go ahead, uh, Daughtry. Thank you, Chair Gordon. I just want to say that I fully support the request to waive the parking. I've worked with the developers, um, with Councilman Ressler's office and representatives from Wyckoff Gardens. Um, uh, and I think that that is, um, I just am in full support of their request to waive the parking. Thank you. Okay, sounds like a motion. <laughs> Other people have their hands up. Okay, we'll give them a chance. All right, anybody, uh, let's see. Ernest, I see, okay, next one I have, I see. Okay, I do see several people. Okay, so the next one on my, my screen, I'm going by my screen, is Ernest Augustus. Well, uh, I'm opposed to wavering the uh, parking requirements. Um, you know, we speak about uh, being located in a transit environment. 
Uh, I've gone down Third Avenue. I don't know how close or approximate uh, what residents would be to a mass transit uh, service. When I think of mass transit, I immediately think of, of the subway. That's as mass as it gets. Uh, but I think it's terribly short-sighted. And it's I think it's ill-served any residents there because, you know, I'm not anti-car. You know, I just do call. Uh, I didn't have a car for 17 years when I got married. That's 17 years. But when I when we had a baby, we had a son, uh, that became a necessity. You know, it became a necessity that I had to have a car to transport my baby from the hospital and then the toddler and so forth. Uh, then reality also began to set in uh, that as we age, and I have aged, I have become more car dependent. Now, Lincoln Wrestler could think that it's nice, but he's going to age also. Uh, that's a, that's a reality, and it's not being and it had nothing to do with with uh, car you know, with with congestion. You know, we can deal with that, but I think it's a, I, I wouldn't live in that building because I would need at one point uh, to have access uh, to an automobile. But I that's just my position. Uh, I'm not anti-car. I support it as an option, as a transportation option. I have lived in the city all my life, and I have transportation is an alternative. I have a car, a bike, uh, rapid transit, and my foot. That's four options. And that's why I live in the city of New York. I don't live in the suburbs because there's only one option in the suburb, and that's the car. So um, I, would I would oppose that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I do think Lincoln Restless maybe found a fountain of youth. He's not aged. Hopefully. Years I've seen him. <laughs> Hopefully. I don't know, but you know, that's, I just like it's short sighted. I think it's just, uh, yeah. you know, it works against yeah. the individual. Yes. Okay. Uh, next one I have on my uh, screen is uh, Bill Fenoy. Thank you, Chair Gordon. Uh, based on the fact that so many individuals have actually participated in this uh, discussion, uh, both board members and also the community itself, and based on the fact that they have discussed this, and uh, the plan has actually been worked through, and it seems that a lot of people are in agreement with this, I'd like to make a motion to accept the uh, the uh, the uh, motion to accept as presented, uh, as far as Europe is concerned. Second. Uh, okay. We have and we have a second. Okay, so we can still have a discussion, but we now have a motion and it's been second. Anything else, Bill? Um, I'll do that during discussion. I'm going to let some of the people discuss and I'll come back around, okay? Okay, if we need to. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, next, I see on my, my screen, I have Esther Blonde. Hi. I think that um, they said that there's cars parked there now. Does anybody know how many cars are parked there now? in the parking spaces. Did they leave? No, they're here. I, I just jump, you know, speaking just from a working group member, um, the parking, uh, current parking is located on the HPD owned lots and the owner, um, Yulano folks can correct me if that's not right. But my understanding is all the surface parking right now is on the lots that are owned by the city that are being developed as part of the 100% affordable piece of the overall development. But I'm going to ask the ownership team to confirm that. I'm asking because I want to know where these cars are going when the parking lot is gone. If, if I may, if if I may speak car. on behalf of the answer that on behalf of the owners, uh, there are, are three locations of grade level parking at present. Um, Two of the locations are on the corners of Wyckoff. One, the larger one on the corner of Wyckoff and Nevins, and a smaller one on the corner of Third Avenue and Nevins. Uh, excuse me, Third Avenue and Wyckoff. Uh, both of those will go away uh, when they are uh, uh, the, when the lease is terminated early uh, to the city. Um, those are, are have been used over the years by the employees. Uh, at the factory, but as the factory's business has dwindled, uh, the employee use has essentially gone away and they're used by members of the community. Uh, there are probably uh, 
55 to 60 spots in those two locations. In addition, there is one location that's owned by the property that will be redeveloped. And that is a small portion at the back of lot 19, which is mid block on Wyckoff. And it is 67 feet wide and about 60 feet deep. It's the back of the factory that has not been built out to Wyckoff. That will become part of the property to be developed uh, in residential form by this ownership or the successor ownership. And, and we've gone through that in various discussions. That is also currently being leased by members of the community. That's probably 20 spots in there. So in the answer to the question in quantif quantified terms, there are currently about 80 spots, most of whom are leased by members of the community. The Third Avenue ones are still used by the factory or office employees, and that's probably 10 to 12 in number. Okay, thank you. That's okay. Okay, uh, next one I have on my screen is uh, Brian, Brian Holland. Thank you very much. Um, I, I also support this. Um, I think the most important thing to remember is the uh, concept of bundling, that when we require that people build parking as part of residential developments, that has to be, the parking has to be paid for. And the way that it's paid for is uh, a portion of the money uh, that renters uh, or people who purchase apartments in the case of uh, owned units um, spend. So requiring that we construct parking drives up the cost of housing. Uh, it makes it harder to provide affordable housing when we require that, pe that people uh, be provided parking spots. Um, I, I, I very much you know, understand that, that certain people need their vehicles. Um, nothing about this prevents people from purchasing a vehicle, finding a spot. Um, all of this does is ensure that people who don't need vehicles and people who don't buy vehicles don't have to spend more of their rent subsidizing the construction of, of spots for their building, whether or not they're used by, by their neighbors or not. Um, so I, I think this really comes down to if we want people to provide affordable housing, we want to make that as cheap as possible for developers to build. Uh, we, we can't insist that they that they build parking because that drives up the cost of providing housing. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Okay, next person I see on my screen is Ms. Ali. I guess you can, can you unmute yourself, Ms. Ali? Okay. Yeah. First, I want to agree with uh, Mr. Gustin about automobiles and the city. I mean, we're moving in a direction where they're affecting people's quality of life at the expense of others. Um, some getting improved and others not. And I want to disagree with Mr. Brian. Um, affordable housing doesn't pay for that parking. Usually buildings use the parking and rent it to Rapid Park so they could make income from it to people who want to park. Some buildings sell it to owners who could afford to buy it, which is the case at University Towers. Um, so it doesn't affect people, low-income people, or any any cost to the building at all. I think I would have preferred to see them put some parking, not and and not do just completely zero. Uh, I think this is very very um, unfair to people who has cars for their jobs. Not everybody has a car for leisure. Some people need the vehicle for their jobs and it is important to have it where they live as much as possible. In my neighborhood where I live, I have people coming from Canarsie area and parking in this neighborhood to get the train. And people who live here cannot find a spot on the street. I live in a heavy brownstone neighborhood, so there's no, no buildings with parking lots. So I'm really sorry that this, this decision was taken and I hope Mr. Ressler really find that fountain of youth and all the people who are following in his footsteps. Thank you, Ms. Ali. Uh, Yvette, next on my screen, Yvette Richards. Thank you, Chair. Um, good evening, everyone. Thank you for that, um, that great presentation. I um, was under the impression that by eliminating the parking, we were going to increase the number of units in the presentation. It wasn't clear to me if the number of units actually increased from the previous presentation to this presentation. So I would like to get clarification on that. 
Sure. So the the parking, as previously proposed, did not count as zoning floor area. So removing the parking does not free up additional zoning floor area. Sure. So there's no increase in the total number of units from what was previously proposed. But what we we do note, and this goes towards one of the required findings for the special permit, is that the the waiver does uh, partially offset the cost of providing the additional affordable housing units that were uh, agreed to as part of the community benefits agreement beyond what is required under mandatory inclusionary housing. Thank you for that clarification. Sure. Thank you, Vet. Uh, Rachel Hong, you can see you can speak, but you won't be able to vote. But you can ask you certainly as a board member, you can ask a question. Uh, yeah, I it's not so much a question, it's just I believe that I specifically remember uh land use committee members uh urging the developer to apply for a parking requirement waiver. Um, I, I, I believe I'm not sure, is that correct? I don't recall, I have to. Yes. I can't. <laughs> yes. This this was this was requested by this board and the council member. Okay. Yeah. yeah so I'm yeah, so yeah. glad. I'm so glad that the developer okay. is like taking the suggestion seriously. Um. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for taking it seriously. Uh. Yeah. New York, like renters, like the private parking will be subsidized by renters, and renters have it tough enough already with housing costs being what they are. So thank you for taking it seriously. Thank you. Welcome, Rachel. Um, let's see. Okay. Um, well, I guess both Brian and Bill have subsequent questions. Uh, okay, let's finish up with Brian and Bill. Thank you. Um, and thank you uh, to Ms. Richardson for the question. I actually didn't quite understand the answer. Um, I was hoping if we could um, expand a little bit on, I understood the first part that it doesn't, um, produce any more land um, that or any more, sorry, any more uh, 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 floor area that can be used, but I was hoping to understand the second part of the answer better, please. Could could you could you clarify, Brian, the second yeah, part you, of the answer? Um, I think you said that um, it helps to offset the cost of providing the affordable housing. I was wondering if you could explain a little bit more about what that means. Well, that there's a certain cost involved with with providing parking, so the the fact that there's a waiver of the parking offsets the uh, the cost of the project to an extent of providing the additional affordable housing units. And this is actually to get to get technical here, a required finding of the special permit that the the waiver would facilitate a project with affordable housing. So we have to have some sort of nexus to the findings in the zoning resolution. It can't just be that this is something that the community board and the, the council asked for. There has to be a basis in the zoning resolution's findings. And that's how we find that, that nexus. So that's 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 what that explanation was for. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry, I still don't understand. I guess what I'm trying to is like, is that in any way, how does that translate for, how does that translate to, um, you know, does that translate to anything for the people who will eventually live there? Does that translate to the prices they'll end up paying? Or I'm just curious how that connects to um, the affordability of the housing. I, I don't know if we've done a economic analysis of this, but the 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 result of the community benefits agreement is that there is additional affordable housing being provided beyond what's required under mandatory inclusionary housing. So I can't speak directly to the the economic impact on the individual renters per se, but I do expect that since that there is a cost associated with parking, not having to provide parking would reduce costs to the renters, but I don't think that's been thoroughly analyzed yet to the point that we can quantify that. Thank you very much. Okay, now I see, I know I have Bill and I guess that, okay, let's, all right, let's, I do wanna move on to the other matters, but okay. Bill, Esther, Yvette, and I'd like to really finish with Yvette. Uh, okay, Bill. Sure, no problem. Thank you, Chair Gordon. Yeah, I just wanted to let people have a comments first before I follow back up. Uh, the reason why I feel I support this uh, is because we're just discussing one issue and one issue only. And that issue is the waiver of all street residential parking requirements. And that's what we are voting on. And that's the only thing we're voting on. 
Um, the fact that I approved this and that I like this is the fact that they're adding community benefits, which also is a sweetener. So because of that, that's why I'm approving this. No other reason. That's the only thing we're discussing right now. That's the only thing we're voting on. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Uh, Esther? I just want to understand. So are you saying that because there will not be parking, there will be more affordable housing units? Not at this project? The, the, the amount of affordable housing units is set by MIH and the Community Benefits Agreement. So that the, the, the removal of parking doesn't necessarily result, does not result in any additional affordable housing units beyond what was already agreed to. So I, I do wanna I do wanna make that clear. So I have been parking since the affordable housing is set by um um well AMI and other things, that wouldn't that to say that we can have more affordable housing if we don't have parking to me is a false statement. Exactly. It's not true. Well, there are I studies think, that parking I, I that, increases. Yeah, man, I'm sorry. Yeah. May, I, may I please, Dan? Okay. Um, uh, Ms. Blount, uh, uh, I think we need to paint this in a broader context. Mr. Flournoy is absolutely right. There's one issue before you, but you're asking for a broader uh, set of uh, background issues. Uh, no, I'm not asking for a set. I want to understand. Well, I'll, I'll, if, I'm, if I may, please. Parking. Wait a minute. We're talking about parking. What's on? We are voting on should we have parking or not parking? But I want to understand if we don't have, if we do vote to have no parking, the statement was made that it helps with more affordable housing. Okay, so well, I'm, you I'm, need I'm, to I'm prove, trying to explain. I want to, I want to see that that really is the case. Okay, that's true. The housing, be, the affordable housing becomes more affordable. That's what you're no, saying. No, it doesn't. Not no, it doesn't. Bill, it goes by the AMI. I disagree. Well, there is a there's a bigger issue here, and and the city councilman very early seized on that. That is, the owners of the factory entered an agreement with the city of New York in 1973 for a 90 year lease of those two corners uh, for uh, uh, that ground to be used as ancillary parking, which meant the factory or anybody else. Uh, the city councilman very quickly seized on. Uh, he would like that to be terminated early so that the city can put on that roughly 20,000 square feet, the city could put roughly 90,000 square feet of, of deep affordable housing on those locations. So when you look at this site, while the application is solely related to basically lot 19, a very irregularly shaped large property, the city is gaining benefit of 25% of affordable housing in that plus five units that the city councilman is, has negotiated and this 90,000 square feet of housing. He's done a very good job in delivering considerable amount of affordable housing. And it's all part of the trade-off uh, in this negotiation. He was very effective. Okay, Esther, uh, let's, I'd like to, uh, I really, okay. I know, okay. I, Last person will be Daughtry. I want to really move on to the voting on this. You had Miss Richardson before me. Uh, she was there and then she left. I mean, I don't have her on my screen. Uh, yeah, I lowered my hand. This. Oh, okay. I lowered my hand. Thank you. Okay. I'll, I'll pass sure. on my question. I just want to um, say, be very clear that um, in transit zones, which is our entire community district is considered one, um, income restricted housing units are waived from any parking requirements. So I just want to be super clear that regardless of parking or no parking, the income restricted units of which we are all very concerned are automatically waived. So if parking is provided, it won't be for those units. I mean, it's up to the operator to determine how, how the parking is actually operationalized, but in terms of requiring it for units, the income restricted units are exempt. So I just want to make that clear. Thanks. Thanks, Dorothy. Last person, Miss Ali, and then we're going to vote.
Yeah, I think people are believing it to be an exchange for for um, no parking, for better prices, or for more affordable units, and it's neither. They're not removing parking and giving back any pluses. It's just removing parking because somebody feel parking cars is 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 um not necessary or arbitrary. Thank you, Ms. Okay. That's my statement. Okay. I'm ready okay, to vote. Okay, we're gonna vote. I think we, okay, yes, we're gonna vote on this now. We, I think we've discussed we from every angle. Okay, Karen, are you ready? Yes. Okay, go uh, ahead. I'm sorry, let's just clarify quickly, remind people what we're voting for. So the motion was made to um, approve as presented by Bill and seconded by me. Yes. Just to remind us. Uh, Ms. Ali? No. Uh, Mr. Augustus? Uh, no. Uh, Ms. Plant? No. Uh, Ms. Bailey? Is she here? All right. Uh, Mr. Mr. Dew? Is he, on, is he a voting member of the committee still? Yeah, right. He is, and Ms. Bailey, Ms. Bailey is also here. Okay. Yeah, I said yes, but I don't know. Could you hear me? No, but thank you. I got you now. Um, Mr. Dew, are you still with us? He's probably on mute. Okay, I'll circle back around for that. Uh, Ms. Karstoffen? Yes. Uh, Mr. Flournoy? Yes. Uh, Mr. Howell? Yes. Uh, myself, yes. Ms. Richardson? Yes. Uh, is Judy on yet? Ms. Stanton? Judy. Okay, yeah, she's not she back. Get back yet. Right, gotcha. And is Ms. Williams here yet? No? Okay. Um, one more chance for Mr. Dew. Okay. Uh, and Mr. Gordon, sorry. Me. <laughs> yes. yes. Okay. One, two, three, right, four, on. five, six, seven, seven, yes, three, no. Does that sound right? No abstention. Seven, three, zero, yes. Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you uh, for your presentation. Uh, Thank the you next all. one. Thank you, <laughs> okay. Thank you as well. Wish you the best. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. All right. Now we move on to the other uh, matter from the other hearing, which is 589 Fulton Street, the curb cut. Uh, well, first we'll open it up for discussion. I know Daughtry had uh, some concerns, so I'll start with Daughtry on this one for at least a uh, discussion. Thank you very much. Um, I think I have some concerns. I, I very much appreciated the presentation because it gave me some context um, for understanding uh, the, the need for this. And you answered some of my questions regarding waste management and DSNY and that kind of thing. I do have some concerns about the location of the cur of the proposed curb cut, its proximity to the intersection of Flatbush, um, its uh, location on a heavily traveled narrow, short and narrow street, which is unusual because right uh, before it turns to the south, it's a very short run. And you've got, we spoke about the buses running, um, also the bike lane. Um, and so uh, I appreciate my neighbors asking questions on, you know, that similar to what I was interested in regarding operational um, issues. Uh, so I have, I guess, um, given, given those things, I wanted to get a little bit more information on how, um, if the loading dock will be 24 hours, I understand that there's intention of having most of move-ins happen between nine and four, but in your on your site plan, you show very large retail spaces on the first floor on on both streets on all streets, Fulton, Flatbush, and those very large retail stores are going to have a lot of loading and unloading that has to happen. One of them is I'm not even sure how the loading dock connects to it because it's the furthest space south. So. I guess with all of those um, concerns raised, I'd like to hear a little bit more about operationalization and how pedestrians and particularly bikers 
um, are going to be protected. As I know, I'm an architect. I understand the new waste management requirements from sanitation. I also know how those trucks move. And what they do, just for the benefit of my colleagues, is the sanitation trucks are, um, that are serving these large buildings, they pull past the loading dock and then they back in. Back in. Mm -hmm. So the loading dock has to be sizable enough so that these new trucks can take a, I believe it's a 30 yard container and dump it, right? So they have to have super high clearances and all that, which I'm sure that this team is taken care of. But there is some concern um, with these trucks backing into the loading dock, which is really the only way that, that they can serve um, the building and any building to be fair that has this new waste management system. So I have a lot of safety concerns there, and I just want to voice them. And if there's some items that you can talk about regarding proximity to Flatbush in the intersection, all the demands on the short run of decal and oper operational issues and safety, I would love to hear it. Thank you. Sure. Um, thanks very much uh, for expressing those concerns. I mean, this, this, and they're very valid concerns, and, and, and some thought has been given to how best to manage. A little louder, please. Thank you. Uh, is, that, is that better? Um, That's I'll, better. I'll ask yes. Adam, Adam Gottlieb to, to speak maybe to some of the operational uh, thought with respect to the retail loading. Uh, I will say, with respect to the curb cut sizing and the need to back in, if we Carlos, are you able to pull the site plan back up? I think it would be useful. Um, yeah, sure. Give me a minute. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> to show how the curb cut was sized. Um, and you, ordinarily, you think of a curb cut, there, there's a loading berth, and the curb cut, the cut is right in front of the berth. In this case, the cut runs a little bit to the west of the berth. If you can go to the Plan right before the, this one. This one, yes. Mm -hmm. So you can see the, the the curb cut that's proposed is, is 38 feet wide, and the reason for this width is to allow for uh, efficient and quick uh, pull forward and back in movements. Uh, so there has been thought given to that, and this would not impact the parking lane on the north side of Decal. Um, the proximity of the curb cut to the intersection is something that requires a separate administrative approval by the Department of Buildings Commissioner following uh, the curb cut authorization. So that will be addressed at the DOB level. Uh, and the last thing is I, I know that ownership is exploring operational safety measures such as flashing lights uh, in accordance with code requirements so that there will be notification when um, the curb cut is uh, active, meaning when a truck is pulling out into traffic or when uh, the door is opening to allow a truck to back in. So I don't know if, if Adam, if you're uh, able to speak to uh, yeah. the space no, planning. Thank, thanks, Nick. Uh, uh, yeah, just a, a couple of the other um, things to note, and we touched on, I think, a little in the presentation, but you know, we, we, we do believe that this loading dock is, um, while it, it's, it's certainly functional. We've had it studied by uh, our, our, our traffic engineers and others and, and gone through the environmental process. Um, it, it is making what we think is really the best out of a tough situation. Um, on Flatbush, there's really no opportunity. Uh, and on Fulton Street, there's opportunity to, uh, to have any curb cutter loading to try and get these trucks off the street. And as you mentioned, I think we, we highlighted that they're really the need and the, and the volume. Um, one of the things that was mentioned just in, in terms of the retail space and the connectivity, I'll just mention there is, you can actually see it on the screen here, there's a block of six elevators, one additional elevator to, to the right, uh, page up and to the right. There's an elevator that actually connects um, subterranean. So uh, the retail spaces on the, on the far uh, south of the block will actually go down and have their trash moved around through the seller space and come up to the loading dock directly. Again, to try and treat, keep other trash bags and things off of the sidewalk. The goal is to really try and funnel everything back through this area um, to the extent that we that, that we can. Um, and, and the reason the dock has been sized for, for, for two trucks and two wide mm -hmm. trucks is so that a move in and a delivery could happen simultaneously um, and, and be staged accordingly, trying to get them off the street. Um, and, you know, we really felt like our our alternative here to, to, to have the tr trucks just park in the bike lane uh, 
was ultimately the, the certainly the greater evil of, of what we're proposing here. And while it certainly helps us operationally, um, without question, we also think there's a, there's an additional benefit. Um, that uh, hopefully that helps answer answer some of the concerns. I, I think I picked up most of them. Okay. Well, thank the you. The only other thing I will uh, say is is just in terms yeah. of the retail. Sorry, in terms of retail, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, not designing them the program for for you know an element like a grocer. Um, I certainly can't say it's not there, but we we have, we have not planned and don't believe there's going to be a grocer. We haven't planned these spaces accordingly. So in terms of use case, that's certainly like the highest use case in terms of waste versus uh, dry retailers or otherwise. So um, we are not hitting that. And in addition, I will just point out that you do have Trader Joe's just up the block. And then there's another, uh, what was it, NYC Fresh Market, just another block or so away. So, well, I mean, if they, they want to put a grocery store in there, well, that's the decision that you make, but <laughs> we'll leave it at that. Okay, um, I'll go next. On my screen, I have Ernest Augustus. Yeah, I'm, yeah. Um, have you looked at the operation of a of the loading dock? Uh, I sort of cringe. I, I cringe when I see uh, trucks trying to uh, back into it. Am I connected? Can you hear me? Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead, Ernest. Okay. Um, when I see 18 rulers or or delivery trucks trying to jockey back and forth to get into a loading bay, uh, I sort of cringe when I see pedestrians walking in front of the cab, walking behind the uh, truck. I cringe when I see automobiles that are backed up, uh, are anxious trying to go uh, in front of the uh, front of the cab. Uh, Unless you have a traffic control uh, agent present uh, to uh, to to uh, you know control the uh, site, uh, it's highly unsafe. I mean, if you just if you go to stop and stop in at Atlantic Terminal, just look at the difficulty of trying to back into a loading bay. I just cringe, and uh, you know that's the only thing. That's just my observation. Uh, you know, based 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 upon that. It'd be safer just to have the trucks lined up on the curb and unload their good, but uh, it's just very tricky. But that's just, I guess, the developer's problem. Just look at that the operation. The Calva Avenue is a busy street. It's a narrow street, and uh, you know, I don't, I don't see how it's going to be done safely. Thank you, Ernest. I don't know. Okay. Okay, I guess the uh, next one will be Bill Flannoy. Yeah, thank you, Chair Gordon. I appreciate that. Yeah, I have a couple of uh, issues and questions also. Um, okay, the waste management, did I hear you correctly, uh, but did you say the garbage would be on the street for no, collections? So this, this, no. this, this plan allows for on-site waste collection rather than on street. So the way, the way it would work is, as Adam said, the uh, garbage collection would be staged in, in a cellar level, uh, and when the DSNY pickup is scheduled, the sort of large waste collection boxes will be moved into one of the berths, allowing the truck to pull into the second berth and accomplish all of the waste collection within the building. Um, okay. Without the loading. Okay. Yeah. So without the loading, we're going to do it all be on the sidewalk. Sure. Now, the other thing I have a problem with also is there's only two loading bays. Um, you're going to have trucks for deliveries for the storefronts also, okay, as well as tenants and everything else you're going to be doing. If there's only two loading bays at any particular time, loading, unloading is not going to take five, 10 minutes. It could take half hour, an hour, whatever that case may be. You're going to have other trucks that are going to come in for a facility this large to make, you know, deliveries or whatever the case may be, moving, whatever. Where are these trucks that are going to be waiting to get into loading dock? Where are they going to be parking? Because it's not going to be something that you're just going to have two trucks every hour. You're going to have multiple trucks leading to unload or load from your location. Uh, in addition to that, uh, the width of the Cobb Avenue is very, very tight. Okay, you're going to have parking directly in front um, 
uh, sorry, on, on the rear end uh, toward the, um, what is that? I forgot what street it is. Bond Street, I believe that is. Okay. Bond. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, they're going to be parked between the loading dock and Bond. Okay. So if the trucks have to pull forward and then pull back in, that's going to be a tight fit. And then on top of that, you're going to have buses coming in and out also. So you're going to have trucks are going to basically be looking to wait someplace along this area to basically unload when the, to the actual loading docks are available. Then you're going to have problems with the trucks backing in. Then you're going to have problems also with the parking. And don't forget also, we have a bike lane. Here. Okay, so with the bike lane, everything else that's going on, the parking on both sides of the street, the buses coming by, pedestrians and car traffic. Okay, um, this is going to be quite interesting. And I realize you have a great plan, a great idea, but I don't think it's going to work as cleanly as you think it will. If you want to comment on that, give me back feedback. I would definitely appreciate it. But right now I'm looking at this plan and it is problematic. Thank you, Bill. I think I would say, okay. as Adam, this, this is this is making making the best of what is what is a tough situation. I mean, the alternative here is that all of the trucks all of the waste collection happens curbside. And so the problems you spoke to, uh, to the extent they're not addressed by this plan would be exacerbated. Um, so uh, this is an, an effort to do as much as we can to remove truck traffic and truck loading activities from the street. Um, and uh, given the, the size and irregular shape of the lot, two berths really was the maximum that could be accommodated. Uh, within the scheme. Yeah, the, the only thing I'd, I'd also add, just from the operations side, um, uh, is, is that you know it is again it is a very big building, right? It's sort of six hundred thousand gross square feet and um, twenty thousand square feet of retail, et cetera. Um, we're we're very aware on the operational side of, of what it's going to take to coordinate um, the move-ins, let alone uh, with those future retailers times and and uh, and, and the necessity of loading and. I think our, our goal would be um, you know, to work with everyone for, for you know, quick loads and otherwise that those would be accommodated otherwise. Um, but, but ultimately um, there's gonna be a have, that's just going to have to be a careful level of coordination with uh, the building management, the facilities management of this property um, to make sure it runs seamlessly you know, regardless of, 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 that, uh, of that dock either way. Um, but certainly we, we, we do believe it's a, it's a benefit to us and, and, to the, uh, and to the neighborhood. And thank you very much. Uh, next person I see on my screen is Ms. Ali. Yeah, I echo all that Bill and um, Daughtry has said. And I think this plan looks good on paper, but I think when you have a full um, complement of rental and residential, it, it will be problematic. But I'm thinking about the other building closer to uh, Myrtle. That's the, the one with the bank. They have a big... Um, base section, almost two or three layers of cars could fit on a, on that. So my question is, do you have the same, like the setback from of the building from the sidewalk of Flatbush Avenue? Do you have that same amount of space the way the build the, the Chase Bank building has? Mm, that's right. Because the, the, you'll probably have trucks waiting in line. You, you know, you're thinking of Amazon, FedEx, USPS coming to the residential. You have deliveries for whatever type. Even if you have a pharmacy, you'll have a lot of deliveries. So do you have that space between the building and Flatbush Avenue where they could just kind of stay and wait in line until they could back into your two loading docks? I'm not sure exactly which, which yeah. property you're speaking to. Um, the one on the corner of Myrtle, the Chase Bank building, it has a very large setback that it's like two or three layers of cars could fit on that spot. Like a staging how, area? I guess making it easier, how, how wide is your setback from Flatbush Avenue on that side? Is it 10 feet or more? Not following what you mean by set from the corner. Ali, are you asking for sidewalk width? Yeah. Yes, from the sidewalk to where the building starts. 
it's 14 feet, or it's 15 feet right here. So I and guess on, on, you could probably on, put some of your overflow there. No, but it's 14 feet is like probably the width of, of, of those trucks. I don't think there's any intention to have trucks parking on the sidewalk. The sidewalk, correct. Uh, not sidewalk. That's not sidewalk. That's that's would be your property extension. Oh, that's beyond our property line. That's the sidewalk. So your property is on the edge, right up on the sidewalk. Correct. So the the building the building is built full to the property line. So oh there's wow. There's no additional space on the property, and so you're seeing the sidewalk here, which is part of the public right of way and then the roadway. Um, right, right. If you had a setback, you probably could have used that. Wow. And given, the, given the size and irregular shape of the lot, that this is, uh, that there wouldn't be room to accommodate uh, a setback like that. In other words, this is a right. tight construction. Well, uh, I think you what you've done on DeKalb is probably the best solution, given what you're just describing, using up all the FAR. Because if you had done a setback, you probably would have had to come a little bit lower and do less units. I guess only time would tell how the congestion will pan out between garbage deliveries for both residential and retail. Okay, well, thank you, Mr. Lee. We have next, uh, Brian, Brian Holland. Hi, um, my, uh, I, uh, echo many of the concerns that um, my fellow board members have made and, and to continue uh, what Ms. Ali was saying. Um, I just been, I spent like the last hour or so trying to find like the common lengths of trucks. Um, uh, it's, it's very hard to find, um, but it, like the, the longest U-Haul uh, is 34 feet end to end. Um, you know, there are a lot of trucks in our city that are, four, there are 48 foot trailers. Um, uh, I couldn't actually find the, the longest length of a box truck, but my fear is that um, if you provide a loading dock, uh, oh, thanks, um, that trucks that are oversized will still dock there and will, you know, block the sidewalk. Um, I, I, you know, I hope you're not you know, using, you know, like uh, illegally oversized trailers there um, that would might block even more of the street. Um, and I'm just curious, uh, you know, given that this isn't the only option and given that we've talked about, yeah, there are going to be many first floor businesses that are also going to have loading needs. Why not just ask for loading docks that could be uh, entered and exited more easily um, and would be accessible to far more um, of the uses in the building? Thank you. So to the last point. And, and maybe Adam can speak to this more. I mean, it, it is, it's a very constrained development site and you have the subway entrance um, on Platbush. Uh, Fulton Street is not available for this type of, of activity. Uh, it's a restricted use roadway. Um, and with the number of, of units in the building, there's a need for a lot of vertical circulation. And there's a de desire to have a lot of, uh, of, of high quality retail at this sort of gateway to this retail corridor. So the site plan is balancing a lot of different needs. Um, the the berths that are here are sized to the um, sort of the, the minimum 33 foot width, which is what accommodates a 30 foot truck when the door is closed. Um, there is a, 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 a desire and an understanding on the ownership side of the operational uh, challenges um, that need to be met to ensure that the loading dock is successful. Uh, and I think that from sort of studies that have been done um, and, and taking into account the unit sizes of some of the of the apartments in the building, uh, it's not anticipated that uh, there will be many, if any, uh, longer trucks that would be used. Certainly not the sort of illegal 53 foot trucks that you see from time to time, um, and, and many of the sort of Amazon, FedEx, UPS. Those those trucks would be accommodated within a berth of this size. So, but I, but I do hear your uh, your point. Thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, you, you mentioned that, you know, subway entrance and things like that, but um, on the DeKalb side, there is no subway entrance. Just what is the issue with loading zones that might exist on DeKalb? Is a Are you asking about a loading zone within the roadway or? 
Yeah, like that, that to me seems the, the, the most, the closest alternative to a loading dock. Well, let me just point out, Brian, the old subway entrance uh, the, for the cab, not where the uh, elevator is on the, uh, I guess, well, I'm looking at the eastern side, on the western side, that is still there. They have to keep that old other entrance, uh, alternative entrance, uh, coming on Flatbush, right by Flatbush Avenue extension, uh, just a little bit off the cow. Uh, I know it's a little tricky, but it's if you look, if you go there in the corner, it's still there. It just it's uh, not being used right now. But that old entrance, it's just steps, no esca no elevators, no escalators, and it's still there. And they have to restore that. They have to restore use of that entrance. And, and just in response, in terms of the uh, in terms of the staging, so to make to make matters a little more complicated, I actually I don't think we can see it on the site plan here. I'm leaning forward to see it. Um, there there is aside from the curb cut, there is also a fire hydrant that is required on DeKalb. Uh, that's in our BPV plan to be relocated just okay. to the east of, of the curb cut, um, which is the reason we we couldn't just have staging in front of our building. Um, so we're working with the city to, to, to move that hydrant slightly out of the way so we could have this cut, but with the hydrant location, we wouldn't be able to stage anything in front of uh, under Cal in the current scenario. Okay, thank you, Brian. Uh, next, Esther, Esther Blunt. I'd like to make a motion to approve the curve cut. Shopping. Okay, we have a motion on the floor. Do we have a second? I have a second with a comment. Am I allowed to do that, Carlton? Uh, it's not a, it's not a recommendation. Comment. My comment yeah, yeah. is I'm finding myself, you guys being developers, being a little bit annoyed with you. And the reason that I'm a little bit annoyed with you is I know how this works, as do many and most of my colleagues on the board. You're coming to us so late in this process that we feel like we don't really have a choice. Where is 600 units worth of garbage going to go if we don't give you the stupid loading dock? And it's frustrating, frankly. Um, and I'm trying not to architect your plans, but your loading dock is not even a loading dock. I don't understand how it works, but I feel, I guess I'm seconding Esther's motion because I feel like I don't have a choice and you need to know that. You have been working on this 600 unit building for years and you're coming to us right now when you're already in construction and we really don't appreciate that at all. Don't do that again. Thank you, Daughtry. Uh, I think we have, I have Yvette has a, has one of the turn on, uh, for her comment. Yes, thank you, Chair. I think Daughtry uh, stole my thunder because it, <laughs> it, it really appears that this was, <laughs> this was it was either you know a grossly over you know like not thought of or oversight and it's and we're being force fed this this loading dock um so i don't i don't know how you know this 52 story residential building was being planned without waste management uh, um considerations ahead of time I mean, this is i think that um was being proposed um as a curb cut for us to decide really needs to have like an operating plan and that most of these deliveries and pickups have to happen off hours, outside of working hours during the night, you know, because that corner is already very congested. And I think that any kind of um, outdoor seating that's across the way on the, on the uh, what would that be? On the north side of the street may have to be sacrificed in order to accommodate these trucks to back in and out of this this space. You know, so I think you're you're losing parking on the on the left. You got the bike lane on the left. You got the I think you're gonna lose parking on the right. Juniors might lose their seating on the right. It's great that we're getting a lot of housing, but it just appears that this is this was really not thought out well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, I have to uh, let's see. All right, I guess I still Bill. Yeah, I still see Bill. All right, last, I want last, Bill's the last person because we want to get the vote and then we want to do the uh, LPCs. 
Thank you, Chair Gordon. Uh, I'm going to basically um, also make a comment. Uh, this plan is not going to work. You're going to have uh, UPS trucks parking on the sidewalk. You're going to have delivery trucks park parking on the sidewalk. You're going to have traffic being blocked by trucks that are not in dock. This is a mess. And I wish you had consulted us before you came to us with this plan. We could have given you some ideas, but right now, this is going to be a mess. You're going to have, I already see it happening on my street where I see delivery trucks and moving trucks parking on the sidewalk so that they do not block traffic. And you're going to have the exact same thing here with a, with a building this large, with this many storefronts, you're going to have a lot of parking problems, a lot of issues and a lot of traffic congestion and, and problems. Uh, but, you know, what choice do we have? You didn't give us a choice. You didn't give us a choice. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Okay, uh, Karen, are you ready for? Uh, yes. Take the roll. Okay. Right. We have motion uh, to approve and duly seconded. Go ahead, Karen. Miss Ali. She was here. Right. Azra. I'll come back. Uh, she's she's muted. Back. She's muted. Okay. Yeah, she's here. She's muted. Yeah, my answer is yes, but yes. I think the developers are just racing to provide housing without considering the quality of life of the people who would be living in them. Uh, Mr. Augustus? I'm going to vote no. I think the developers uh, don't care about people who are living there. They just want to make their profit uh, and impact the neighborhood. Uh, you know, you don't have to be an architect or a PhD scientists to realize you deal with, with garbage disposal up front when you're planning, okay. you know. All right, we got so to vote now. Um, Ms. Blount? Yes. Yes, of course, <laughs> your motion. Uh, Ms. Bailey? Yes. Uh, Ms. Kerstoffen? Reluctantly, yes. <laughs> uh, is Mr. Jew here at all? I don't think so. Okay. Uh, Mr. Flanoy? Uh, I'm abstaining. Okay. Okay. Uh, Mr. Gordon? Yes. Mr. Howald? No. Uh, myself? Yes. Uh, Ms. Richardson? Yes. Uh, is Judy here yet, Ms. Denton? Yes. Okay. And I vote no, Karen. I'm proud of my colleagues who have the courage to say what they believe. You got it. No. Uh, and Ms. Williams, not here. Okay. Uh, so we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, yes. And we have one, two, three, uh, one, two, three, no, and one, one yeah. abstention. One abstention, yeah. That's what I have. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Okay, uh, now it passed with great reluctance, and I hope the uh, you keep in mind the presenters keep in mind what comments we have made. Thank you. Okay, uh, now we're going to move on. over to our landmark preservation commission certificates of appropriateness. Uh, the first one is one Cambridge Place in the Clinton Hill Historic District. Uh, as I said earlier in the meeting or get, or get together, I know that the um, Clinton Hill groups have asked for a postponement of this one. I said, let's, we should really move with this one because we only have a limited amount of time on these matters. Uh, basically, they're looking at a, uh, doing a lot of work on the, you know, moving up in the parapets and they want to do a lot of other work uh, you know, up on the roof area, extending. Uh, it's a, doing a, they're doing a lot of work up on the front and on the, on the roof and the facade, uh, on the roof, especially doing work on the roof deck. So uh, we want to, uh, we'll still open up the uh, presentation on this one for one Cambridge place. Uh, go ahead. Good evening. Hi, my name is Robin Fleming, representing RMF Bryant Architects, presenting for one Cambridge place. Uh, let me just share my screen. 
Okay, we're applying to landmarks for a certificate of appropriateness. We have basically completed construction and are seeking your approval for several as built conditions. The first and most significant is raising the parapet of the existing two story extension of this entire property, approximately 21 inches, to provide for the requisite protective guard height of a new roof deck that we installed here. The property is located on the corner of Cambridge Place and Green Avenue, so it does have high visibility. If you look at the 1940s tax photo, you can see the extension here, the same extension in the 1980s tax photo. The property was designated in 1981, a year after this 1980 tax photo. On the Green Avenue side, we have an existing parapet that's approximately, had an existing parapet that was approximately 21 inches in height. And we raised it another 21 inches to reach the 42 inch requisite height. This is the existing condition. And this is the proposed condition. Um, we initially had approval to add a railing on the inside of the parapet, but during the course of construction, we discovered that the parapet itself was deteriorating. And because the property is located on a bus route on Green Avenue, there is substantial vibration and separation of the parapet wall from the uh, rest of the building. So we decided we had to rebuild the parapet anyway to address those structural integrity issues. And we thought it was a better from the perspective of a lot of substantial internal leaking that we had that instead of having a railing mounted to the roof that would potentially interfere with the roof, roof membrane and cause further leaking damage to raise the parapet instead to reach that protective guard height. So this is the existing condition on the rear side of the building opposite the Green Avenue side. And this is the proposed condition of raising the parapet an additional 21 inches. This is the original rear elevation, which you can see if you're walking from the direction of Green Avenue towards Cambridge Place. And this is the end result of raising the parapet 21 inches. On the left, you see the original condition of the parapet. And on the right is the completed condition of the raised 21 inches. On the left side, the five photographs are the existing condition on the ins, looking from the roof deck to the parapet. And on the right side are the same viewpoints with the raised parapet. That is the first uh, condition that we're seeking um, review and approval of. The second condition is the rear elevation, which you can see if you approach the building from Grand Avenue, are the existing windows that had a rectangular shaped window with an arched header. The new windows have a rectangular window. We basically replicated what was there prior to the designation of the historic district. Um, landmarks would have preferred that we had arched windows, arched segmented, a segmented arch of the header, as illustrated by the what? Sorry about that. This is what landmarks would have preferred. Um, but instead, we installed a rectangular window with an arched header, as you can see here. And the third condition that we're seeking review and approval of is the elimination of the brick molds on the Green Avenue windows. Um, the designation report from 1981 indicates that prior to the designation, these brick molds have been removed. 
And due to cost considerations, we did not reinstall the brick molds. And it's very difficult to see in the, the tax photos, but there were no brick molds when the property was designated. And those are the three conditions that we're seeking review and approval for. Um, we'll welcome any questions that anyone may have at this time. Okay, I just want to underline all the work that proposed has been completed yes okay all right are there any questions from uh, committee members Col yeah colton did the committee receive uh letters of objection from the Fort green association from the society for clinton hill and from citizen for responsible neighborhood planning did the committee receive these letters had they been read by the committee members i have not I have not seen any letters. No, I you do have not receive any of the. We do have them. Okay. We have them. Oh, you do have them. Okay. Yeah. I haven't seen them. Okay. okay. And um, everybody has one. Okay. That... I mean, I have the letters. I have uh, um members from the Society for Clinton Hill and and from CRMP that have signed in on this June. I don't want to read the letters. I think that uh, that uh, Bajari can speak to her to speed this meeting up and to note the objections uh, and to ask some clarification. Would that be helpful? We need to know what the letters say. Well, I, I again, I I could read it or I could ask Bajari just to speak to it. Uh, so to speak to it. You, I heard a complaint from a resident of the Clinton Hill district saying that the applicant had not presented to her group and she was not getting any help in reaching out to the applicant. She didn't have any contact information for them. Uh, Bajari, can she? Mr. Gordon, can Ms. Sidney speak since so she represents all three organizations? Uh, okay, well, let me just go through members first, who, uh, and then uh, if we need to get a summary from Ms. Sinisi, I'll ask Ms. Sum I'll ask Ms. Sinisi for a summary. I have uh, a sum let us summarize. I don't want to read these three uh, letters, Carlton. Yeah, I, I don't think we, we have, still have some work to do on this. Uh, other, them, other members. Yeah. If you can I summarize, uh, if you can summarize it, I'd appreciate it. She can summarize. She's very good at it. Okay. All right. Um, well, right, we'll leave it at that for the moment. Uh, Ms. St Judy, Ms. Stanton, do you want to, uh, I'll have you next if you wish to. It, it is my impression that we are being asked to legalize. Is that, isn't that the matter at hand? Um, it, it sounds, if I'm mistaken, I thought the architect said that some of the requested changes have already been installed and are in place. And yes, yes. All, th all three conditions that we're seeking your review and approval for have been installed. The construction has been completed on the project. It, it, I'm sorry, maybe everybody else understood that. Then the correct term for those who compose the agenda, those of us on the committee, um, this is a legalization request. Thank you. That answers my question. Okay, thank you. Um, okay. Okay, I'll, is, uh, I'll, guess, I'll give Ms. Sinise, if you can give a summary of the, of the group's point, your group's point, I uh, appreciate it. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Uh, yes, a summary would be fine. Okay, I'll, I'll make it quick. Um, I just wanted to make a very fast comment about something that you had said at the, the top of this. Um, in the past, now for the past year and a half or so, we've gotten an email from the community board introducing us to an applicant and inviting them to contact us. Taya had said that the applicant could not be compelled to contact us, and we understand that, but at least we had the contact information. This time we didn't get that. 
and we've we received nothing for, in terms of plans or any information, including that this was a legalization from the applicant. And we, I mean, this process in the past has not delayed anything. I understand that everybody's in a hurry, but we've always gotten our commentary in before the meeting, and those letters were sent yesterday. Yeah. So Taya had said she had cc'd them to everybody on the committee. Now I'll proceed to my comments on on the actual presentation. Um, I I would hope, you know, just in closing on that, that the community board represents the community and at least would be helpful in getting us the contact information. Because in the past, when we've had that, it's actually been helpful to both us and the applicants because it's addressed some things that would have come up at the LPC meetings that could be addressed and negotiated beforehand. We've had a lot of success at that. Okay, moving on to the application itself. Um, it was not the only piece of information we had was that one thumbnail that was attached to the agenda. And our comments were based on that with respect to what is a primary facade as defined by LPC along Green Avenue. This is not something secondary. That extension was added in 1919. It's part of what was landmarked in the 1981 designation report. And basically this applicant went ahead on all three items, despite the fact that we hadn't seen the other two and proceeded to execute them without presenting to LPC. So th this lifting of the parapet impact sight lines from the primary Green Avenue facade across the top of that parapet, I would imagine if it had been presented to LPC, there would have been a mock-up required and sight line calculations done from the, the Green Avenue facade. There's nothing, and it, it really affects the proportions of the extension versus the uh, garage, which was done at the same time. And honestly, I I think that basically LPC should not approve this because everything was done, apparent, and everything is in full view if you look at the photographs that we presented. I, and there's, there's nothing impeding the sight lines at all. And this was all constructed and done as the applicant noted, you know, LPC would have preferred, you know, this and that, but it was all done without a presentation to LPC apparently. And I don't understand why the community board would not be interested in input from the local historic groups, which in the past has only been helpful. So we're, yeah. Again, we're, we're interested and that's why we have you here. But, what but I'm saying is that, the letters and I'll just want to, yeah, I just want to make it, you know, clear is that the problem really isn't the problem is that when LPC comes to us and gives us a an application, they only give us usually within thirty to forty days in which to respond. That usually means that we can only have really one bite of the apple uh, because we have a monthly meeting. Sure, but we take uh, a week, we, not 30 to 40 days, just to, to interface. No, I mean, well, that's the, yeah, but by the time we get to it, by the time we get to it, we only have a, a, maybe a few, yeah, only a few days. But you would have gotten to uh, it earlier for, if we'd had. Well, we can only do what we can do at the meetings. We can only do it at the meetings. We can't, uh, we can't push it off if. You know, it's it, that's what I'm trying to make. Uh, I'm going to make that clear. Okay, let's uh, move let on. Me do, yeah, I want to move. It. Yes, uh, I see this Rue Benner. Who is Rue Benner? Why are you interested? If if I may speak to the um, Miss Sinisi, we weren't even aware of these historical societies when we did the project. Number one, we would have been more than happy to present to them. Number two, this issue of the parapet arose during the course of construction. We had significant internal leakage into the building that was already renovated, and we had to find a expeditious resolution to the issue. We have subsequently become aware, we thought we could do it as an as-built condition, and in our conversations with LPC, we realized that no, this is something that couldn't have been an as-built just certificate of appropriateness that we had to present to the community board. So we're, we were kind of stuck during construction on how to address the internal leakage because the parapet was deteriorating and separating 
from the rest of the building. And how about for the windows and the other things? You just kind of like followed your own guideline on that? Well, with the windows, um, the brick mold, that was an oversight during construction. That was not an intentional thing. However, there were no brick molds there before once Landmarks brought it to our attention that we needed to have the brick molds. And with the segmented arch windows, we basically replaced what was there before the designation of the property in 1981. So the windows that we reinstalled were basically what was there in 1980 and had been there since 1957. Okay, thank you. Um, Esther, you have your, you have a comment or? Look, Jesus, it's already done and it shouldn't have been done. And um, I make a motion to disapprove and let Landmark deal with it because it's three items. It's the project was done. I mean, maybe that's why we didn't get drawings or whatever. It wasn't proposing anything. They already did it. So I make a motion to disapprove and then we go from there. Okay. I second. We have a second. Second. A second. Okay, the motion's been made and it's seconded. Uh, all right. Uh, I see this, uh, Miss Who Benner? Who? Rosalind Hubner, can you hear me? Yes, can you hear and me? who are you, you and what's your you, interest? You, you can hear me, is that correct? Yes, I can hear yeah. you. Thank you, sorry. Um, Yes, uh, with regard to, um, uh, well, I was, I was, uh, I'm the corresponding secretary for the Fort Greene Association, so one of those letters oh, was from me, All right. and, um, <clears throat> excuse me, and um, had no idea that this had already been done, uh, but with regard to the um, idea that building a brick parapet wall higher stops leaks is absurd. I know enough about construction. I've done enough of it. I know enough about um, roofs and, you know, it, it does not stop leaks or there would be higher parapet walls all over the city. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, this, the, um, uh, to meet the safety requirements, what most people do is simply add a rail, if it's a 20 inch rail or whatever, on top of the parapet wall. It does not cause deterioration, whatever. So that thinking is... is if, if I may speak to that, we're not saying that raising the parapet solved the leaks. What we're saying is we had to rebuild the parapet to address the leaks. The mm -hmm. additional height does no, obviously does nothing for... Yeah, yeah I, I for, believe you yeah, said that the in leaks. the initial presentation. I'm sorry. So maybe yeah. you... Yeah. That, okay, and then okay. and then in terms of in the yeah, in terms of putting an additional twenty one inch railing on top of the parapet, our initial application landmarks did not want that. They wanted the railing to be set back from the parapet six to twelve inches so that you couldn't see it. And that would have required us to penetrate the roof membrane to mm -hmm. anchor the railing which we felt would have added to the leaks. I believe there are a, a number of ways of anchoring rather, in, rather right. than going from the roof. I figured I'd try to avoid having to go back and forth. Yeah. Uh, Sorry. I know it's a yeah. forum, but yeah. but thank you. I wanted I to just check it back with, I, see, I still see uh, hands up for uh, Ernest and Esther and Judy. Do you have any further comments? Any of you have further comments or questions? My hand is up because I have a question, Carlton. Go ahead. I think there's a basic misunderstanding here about the process and why this is being brought to us. The staff could not approve the matters, these, the, the, the three items that need to be legalized. That is why it's going to a public hearing. When anything goes to a public hearing, as you all well know, it comes to the community board. But it's not the commission that brought it, brought it to the community board. It's the applicant bringing it to the community board, not the commission. The commission just considers it ready for a hearing. But I'm willing to bet that the architects on the commission are going to know that um, the rebuilding the parapet wall is not going to solve the, 
leaky roof, and they're going to vote unlikely. They're likely it's not. They'll vote no. But this committee does never have never has to approve anything that is inappropriate or that members have issues with. Somehow we have this. Some of you have an obligation that you have to approve everything. That's all. Well, we have a motion to disapprove, which has been duly seconded, and that's what's before the committee right now. Uh, Mr. Lee, you have anything yeah. else you wish to add? I just, no, I just want to know when exactly did she do this um, this work that we shares up now applying to legalize? When was it done? Approximately six months ago. Oh, well, recent as that, because I was thinking it happened in the eighties. Wow. No, 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 no. It's very recent. Wow. Okay, so we could vote. Okay, are there any other comments from committee members, board members? Is there Hearing any? None? I'm sorry, Carlson. Yeah. Is there anything yeah, that ahead. we can tack on to the disapproval that helps landmarks understand why we're disapproving it? Because it's not appropriate. <laughs> okay, I'm just asking. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I, I think Rosario made some good points about sight lines as well. It's all very visible. But... Um, may I ask a question concerning the sight lines? What is the issue with the sight lines? Rosario? Can you hear me? Yes. There is a process for examining sight lines that is established by the Landmarks Preservation Commission, particularly when you're dealing with a primary facade, you set up a mock-up and the Landmarks Preservation Commission staff goes and looks at it and they take photographs and they see how the sight lines are affected from the north side of Green Avenue across the existing landmark wall and how they would be affected by heightening that parapet and none of that was done and the real problem is that the applicant seems to be completely unfamiliar with the landmarks preservation commission process and i would really appreciate it if our groups could get a copy of the drawings that were just shown which we've never seen before except for that one thumbnail that was you know put up in the agenda on the basis of which we raised our objections and I really hope that in the future, at least we can get contact information for applicants because we can make your lives a lot simpler. I mean, this something like this could have been resolved before it ever got to you. We've negotiated things that you've then approved and we've all been happy. Can I call to question on this? Yes, please. Let's, uh, let's uh, just start I, the- I still uh, have my hand raised, so I would like to. <laughs> oh. And I haven't had a okay, chance to- Bill, let's yeah. <laughs> okay, I think, okay, Bill, you'll be the last one. Uh, thank you, Chair. Chair Gordon. There are a lot of hands raised, and I realize it may have been missed. This is a tough one. Um, the applicant, I believe, was trying to do the best, had good intentions here, but I don't think they actually knew the process. They were unaware of certain agencies, and they were unaware of the specific ways that things are being are supposed to be done. Uh, it's 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 really difficult because, you know, ignorance is not an excuse. Okay, uh, we're talking about appropriateness, and as has been discussed, had this applicant gone through the process, we may have said this was appropriate. I don't know how to go forward with this because, in one hand, we have a person who's trying to do the right thing; on the other hand, they didn't do it the right way. So how do we go about making a decision on this? I think Daughtry mentioning that there's a way we can comment about this situation so that they understand that the process was the problem, not the end result. So I don't know how to work with this, but this is where I am right now with the discussion. Mr. Flano, I think that's a really astute question and if I could um, offer an, a comment to assist. Um, you actually don't need to make a decision on the process. You may or may not be correct about whether the architect did or did not know what was appropriate or was or was not ignorant of the process. The only question before the committee is whether having reviewed images that the architect showed you, do you think that the requested three requested changes are appropriate and the board and all members of the public including any of the historic organizations present, are welcome to ask as many questions as you want to reach a conclusion. 
we are very fortunate to have licensed engineers and architects on our committee, but it is not a requirement for that reason. In any case, the question's been called. Uh, let's get the uh, vote on this one. Okay, Karen, you're ready? Yes. Uh, Miss Ali? No. Mr. Augustus? Okay, uh, uh, okay no. Let's, let's be clear. Wait, it's let's be clear what we're voting on. Sorry, yeah. It's a motion to disapprove, yes. The motion right. to I am, yes. not, I am right. not going along with that. I am saying no. Right. Okay. Mr. Augustus? Uh, no. Ms. Splott? Yes. So when you say yes, you're voting to disapprove. Disapprove. Right. Yes. Okay. Right. Yes. It's a yes. motion to disapprove. Okay. Um, Let me reconsider. My, yeah, my vote is yes to disapprove the applicant. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, Ms. Bailey? Abstain. Abstain. Uh, Ms. Kerstoffen? Yes, to disapprove. Uh, Mr. Flunoy? Bill? Yeah, I know. Um, I'm sorry. <laughs> you want me to come back to you? Yeah, come back to me. Okay. Uh, Mr. Gordon? Yes. Uh, Mr. Howard? No. Myself, yes. Ms. Richardson? Abstain. Uh, Ms. Stanton? I vote yes to disapprove. This is easy. It's inappropriate. Exactly. Um, I guess Mr. Flannoy, we're back to you, sorry. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go with no. Okay. No, all right, let's see. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, yes. We have one, two, three, no, and two abstentions. Does Option that passes yeah. barely? 11. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. That's it. Motion passes to disapprove. Okay, thank you, everyone. Uh, next one is Forty Garden Place in the Brooklyn Heights Historic District. Uh, this one is we want to do some work at their entranceway and also do some work on the uh they want to do a little bit of excavation work i guess near the near the entrance hello can everyone hear me yes go ahead all right so let me share my screen Sorry. Uh, okay, I can see. We can see. Go sorry, ahead. Sorry. Yeah. No, I tried. It was full screen. And for some reason, my screen just started flaring up. Sorry. All right. We'll do the best we can do. <laughs> <laughs> full screen. Then. Thank you. Can you hit the plus sign so it's enlarged a little bit? Yeah. Does Does everyone see it now? Full it screen. It could be a little bigger. It's not full screen. It's not on your end. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, it's just okay. take your time. It's okay. You could hit the plus, or you could increase from fifty. All right. Yeah, we'll do it just from the screen size then. Does everyone see the full sheet? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> A little bit. <laughs> A l uh huh. Wonder what's going on. I recommend just zooming in more, Andrew. Okay. If I just a so you know, on my better. a little okay, because if I zoom in a little bit more, then it cuts off on my end. Um, I think we can handle it. Let's keep okay, it. Okay, right. sorry. Yes, this will yeah. be quick. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you yeah. for having me tonight. Yeah. My name is Andrew Acevedo. I'm with the Brooklyn Studio, uh, representing the owners of the building as the project manager. Um, <clears throat> as mentioned, I'm here to present a new basement level facade and plan for the front areaway of 40 Garden Place. Um, the site is in the Brooklyn Heights Historic District. Landmark records show the set of row houses on the street were built between 1861 and 1879. Um, the lot itself is on the west side of Garden Place between State and Girolamo Street. The current tax photo really doesn't give us much in terms of the front area way, so, but what it does show is 
you know, how beautiful all nine of these original row houses looked at the time of this photo was taken. Um, next slide. Uh, in this stitch collection of uh, facades, we're looking at all nine of the row houses on that street. Um, ours is the one at the end of it, 40 Garden Place. Again, out of these nine, three currently have sunken areaways, 56, 54, and 46, which covered the scaffolding at the moment. Um, these next couple of slides are sort of the existing um, conditions from the street. The 40 Garden Place, you can see the knee wall current condition of the knee wall, the gate and ironwork that leads down to the areaway. A couple more close ups too to look at. In the next slide, we get a little closer. We're inside now of the gate and fence, uh, sorry, the gate and uh, ironwork and knee wall. And we start to see the current existing condition of the areaway and the steps that lead down to the basement door and the two existing windows that are there, currently covered with screens. And so what we did, we did a mapping of the neighborhood and try to show where the two, where the three current uh, sunken areaways are, 50, lot 54, lot 53, lot 49, and uh, across the street um, from ours, 14 and lot 10 both have uh, sunken gardens as well. But of the original nine row houses, uh, three currently have new sunken areaways. Um, <clears throat> and then we took a lot of, we pretty much took our inspiration from what was done already on 46 and 56 Garden Place, um, with the only exception that, um, the only difference between these two is that 50, 46 kept this sort of the scallop uh, detailing at the head of the window, and that's something we're keeping on ours too, and then we're just extending the windows down, but keeping the same width. Um, going into our project now and plan demo view and you can see the area that we're proposing that's excavated it's around 51 square feet um it's 50 percent less um than the total square footage of the area um again resurfacing the existing knee wall that's to remain uh the existing iron working gate is existing to remain we're going to restore and repaint uh the new brown we'll have to apply a new brownstone finish um underneath in the area that we excavate uh, the existing windows will be removed, and as well as the uh, black screens that are, we saw in the pictures. And then looking at the construction plan, you start to see what we're going with. Again, existing new water remain, existing gate, and then uh, ironwork to remain. Two new planners on each side at the level, the current existing level that we have now and then the steps leading down now right straight from the street level down to the sunken area way and then just one step down into the basement entry um, new iron work at the gate for the windows and new wood windows as well uh, you have a better look at the elevation here and again just like you saw in the previous images for the existing inspirations we essentially copied the same look and feel all this is original detailing kept the band everything from this band below is new um, the proportions of the window are this so height is determined by the clearances required inside for mechanical uh, and plumbing work that's coming into the building and then in black finish uh, matching the existing stucco that's already on the building and then these last couple images and the rendering, we showed sort of the whole elevation from the street level. And as you can see, nothing really changes. You'll see a little bit more light now coming into the basement from the street. And in this final slide where we cut through the basement area where you can see as a whole facade, the picture of what we're trying to propose and how much of the front area we actually have to excavate to make this work. Um, Oh, I thought that was my last slide. So thank you for your time and consideration, and I welcome any questions. Okay, thank you. Uh, I understand, Stanton, that the uh, you Brooklyn Heights Associations received a uh, presentation and discussed it. We did. Is that an invitation to say something, Garland? Uh, yes, yes, exactly. Oh, thank you. Um, we did review it. They, they sent, um, Brendan and Andrew sent the plans to us. I live on that block. I'm in this row. In fact, I'm 
I'm at number 52, um, but I don't have a sunken area away. Yeah. yeah, my house is in there somewhere um, to the left of 50. You keep going. Yeah, that one, that's mine. Uh, I'm 52, by the way, no, it's, it's, there we go. Um, but my, the VHA's comment was, um, and I don't think I'm seeing it reflected, am I, Andrew? Um, the new stucco design pattern on the basement wall um, they thought, look, this is what the committee thought looks fine, but they wanted the applicant to consider whether there's any value in simply matching one of the other houses in the we row that previously added a deeper area way, like 46 or 56, which are similar, instead of introducing another variation. And I think you've introduced another um, variation by scoring the, the brownstone front is that andrew am i seeing no, the plan i don't know if you can see the proposed one and then i'll go back to the inspo images but no judy we did we took your consideration to heart and so did brendan we copied exactly what 56 okay and All 46 right. we're doing yet yeah, it's just i'll leave it here on the proposed and then i'll go in a second i'll go back to the inspo okay. images yeah you have i don't think you sent us a revision did you no okay well that, that would be that would help the luddites like me if you could do that <laughs> no problem the only Luddite on the committee, though. Everybody else is very skilled. And the second thing we suggested, but it's not a big deal. It's just whether or not you wanted to consider reversing the gate so it swings to the left instead of um, to the right, where it'll hang over the new stairs. What did you, you think about that? Well, it's the, both planners are on the same level. It would, it would be the same steering scenario. So it's not gonna, not gonna go over the, hang over the edge of the. No, it would. You, we could be dyed into the. Well, actually, you're right. Maybe we could swing it all the way so it's into the planner side on this side. I see what you mean, Andrew. Things to the left, but I don't have a sunken area way, so mm -hmm. it just hits my tulips. But it doesn't. It rather swings to the right, but it doesn't um, go over the, the basement staircase where this might. Anyway. That wasn't that is that's not a deal breaker for us. It was just a suggestion or recommendation by the architects on our committee. Thank you very much. Uh, I see Bill Fonoy's hand first. Motion to approve as presented. Okay. Second. Second. It's been seconded. Motion to approve and it's second. Uh, I see Miss Ali's hand. So you're muted. I'm, yeah, I'm not understanding the entrance. Um, this, the first door goes from the street, but is that second door a dummy door, the one above it? Or, or are there steps that I don't see? Um, were we talking about this door? Yeah. That's the main door into the parlor. So up the stoop and into the parlor floor. And then this door is to the basement. Okay, but I don't see the stoop. How do you, how do you get oh. up there? Um, you can see it from here. It's so a it's, section. It's a section. So, so this is so. these are the quarried steps that lead down to the basement. And then this over here is the stoop that leads up to the parlor floor. Okay. You see there. Ah, uh, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's been motion's been moved, uh laid on the floor and it's seconded. Are there any other Comments? Hearing none, Karen, you can start the vote. Unmute. Karen, unmute. Thank you. <laughs> My fault. Okay. Uh, Kelly? Yes. Uh, Mr. Augustus? Uh, yes. Uh, Esther Blount? Yes. Uh, Ms. Bailey? Yes. Ms. Kerstoffen? Yes. Uh, Mr. Flournoy? Yes. Mr. Gordon? Yes. Mr. Howell? Yes. Myself, yes. Ms. Richardson? Yes. Ms. Stanton? Judy? Yes, I'm unmuted. Sorry, sorry. Excellent. Well, it's unanimous. 
One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Thank you. Very good. Uh, last one we have here is 245 uh, Bergen Street in the Borm Hill Historic District. Uh, oh, yes. And this is a, they're going to do some work on the storefront on this particular, at this particular location. So whoever has uh, 245 Bergen Street, uh, come forward. Milbauer or Michael Just? They appeared to be a no-show. I thought they were on earlier. Yeah. I'll reach out to the applicant. All right, no. Uh... Okay, no show on that one. Uh, okay. We don't have anybody else. Uh, we'll move on to the chair's report. Uh, I came across a what was called an affordable housing over at uh, 55 uh, Fleet Place, uh, 65 Fleet Place rather, and a, uh, also called the Brooklyn Tower. And they are looking for affordable applicants at this location. Uh, they must make a minimum of 90,000, 122,000 to up to 215,155. And the studio rental is $2,620 a month. Uh, this is instead of 130% AMI. Yeah. That's not they affordable. They are pet friendly. Well, they are pet friendly. So <laughs> that's, that's, the, that's a joke for it to call that affordable. Yeah, well, it's listed as affordable, came up, and perhaps no, but, somebody in. Yeah, but in, for the AMI and for the size of the apartment for that number, it's ridiculous. Yes, all right. Oh, well, uh, second thing I just wanted to point out is that St. Francis College has sold its buildings. St. Francis over at, uh, by Remsen and Drolleman. Uh They say that they're going to move someplace in downtown Brooklyn, although I, have, I do not know the new location, but they have sold their property, uh, their buildings. Now, uh, yes. next we, yeah, go ahead. I was gonna say, they've already established themselves on top of Macy's. Oh, yeah, are. all along Livingston. Yeah, interesting. <laughs> well, it does make yeah, that's it's helpful to uh pick up a couple of shirts and pants and then go to class. So uh <laughs> what is the, uh, what is the new yeah, go ahead. Who is the new occupant? Did you all say who, who bought the building? Uh, no, I have it's no I have no I have no information on the new occupant of the uh, St. Francis College buildings. But I just wanted to make sure, you know, pass along that information. You know, uh, uh, is there any chance yeah. that it will still be a polling, a, a, a voting location? It's been a, it's been a um, poll location for quite a long time. And it's actually one where a lot of people vote in this particular council district. It's the busiest oh. um, voting location. Yeah, I don't. Um, yeah, I don't know how they uh, work. How they work those out, or they will uh, board of elections. I guess and where they maybe they'll they'll continue to have it in the lobby. Uh, yeah. There are some residences or commercial properties that do have board of election activity in their lobbies, but I don't. At this time, I don't know. All I know is that. Yes, St. Francis is uh, moving, sold it and moving. In fact, well, isn't it part of the the Catholic Church um, big sell off of schools and properties? Uh, that's it could be considered that. Uh, mm. As a matter of fact, one thing it also St. Francis is also closed that 
They're also um, stopping, or at least they stopped all their athletic, they've closed their athletic department entirely. No more teams, all oh. their teams are, are no longer in existence. So that's they're, a, now uh, in, they're now existing in office space. Yes. <laughs> so they don't have that's land it. and... Um, yeah, yes. Other than that, uh, we have, uh, we now can move over to, uh, now we can move over to the public. Are there any public comments uh, any, on any uh, matters? Uh, Chair Gordon, I have my hand raised. I don't know if you see it or not. Okay, go ahead, uh, Bill. Go ahead. Okay, cool. Yeah, um, on the matter of St. Francis, uh, property has now been sold. Um, as we just saw just tonight, tonight uh, during the committee meeting, some of the individuals who are developers who are actually doing work are coming to us after the fact and asking us to make a vote on items that have already been decided in a way that there's nothing we can really do except make a suggestion one way or the other, which they can ignore for the most part. Is there any way we can actually take pro be proactive and outreach these individuals who are actually doing these, this construction in our district? Because I think that may, may be a good idea right now, especially if we know in advance that there's been a purchase and there's going to be construction. The trick is getting the information first. I mean, I only found out about the St. Francis. Uh, it came up on my phone. It was in the paper, know, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's how information, you know, we get this information. And it's, uh, if we can get the information quickly, great. And and Bill, you're on the, uh, you know, you're the uh, the bid. <laughs> yeah, I, they're yeah. not giving it to you. Yeah. No, I, I received the information. Okay, yeah, I received yeah, the information yeah. on the bid. Yeah, okay, yeah, but yeah, what I'm yeah. suggesting is basically this: I actually sent you an item the other day in regards yeah. to an, an individual who had purchased several lots. Okay, and I mentioned it to this committee that he now has mm. several lots that he has now has a bundle of lots and. Obviously, he's going yeah, to do something with that bundle. <laughs> right. So I sent that to you. And uh, St. Francis was aware of also that they were going to do the sell. It's just a matter of when they were going to do it. So the item, mm -hmm. item the, the issue now is once we know a purchase has been made, uh, for instance, Ms. Uh, Daltrey was actually has been on some of the, uh, yes, Daltrey, I'm actually bringing you up. I'm sorry. I apologize. Uh, <laughs> has been in situations where she can actually give input to contractors, sorry, developers, as they're making the plans. And it'd be nice if we could do that with all of the developers to actually have some sort of input prior to them coming to the committee. You know, we're, we are stakeholders. We are stakeholders, yeah. in a sense. Yes, definitely. Yes. Perhaps, it, you know, we can go. I would say, okay, Bill, if we can... Uh, Maybe lay out lay out something that we just as you have it here, and perhaps we can uh, vote on it at a, a future uh, meeting. So that it we might can depend have on least... if they're doing an as of right development yeah. or a ULERP, because if they do as of right, we don't have a whole lot of say. But mm -hmm. I like your idea. That's the other one. Noticing right. that's true. Also, you know, Karen. I think that's a po good point from Karen. I mean, we can still sort of at least nag them as a good government group to say, uh, we know it's the as of right, but can you talk to us anyway? You know, <laughs> you know, something like that, you know, just something we can, we could, you know, we could come up with something like that. You have a night, see if we could lay out something and perhaps we can maybe vote and then at a future uh, meeting to see something that the committee and the board can do. Uh, Esther, I see your hand up. Did this committee approve the project on, on um the building on Fulton Street or wherever this building is? It's not five five eighty nine Fulton or did we approve that building that they building? Not yet. All we have right now is just they the just come cut? to us with the it's a curb cut. I mean, yeah, they laid out what their plans are. It wasn't a ULER. But, it wasn't a year. So we didn't, we yeah. didn't, it didn't come before us. No, it did not. No. Oh, no, no. No. We, as a okay. right. As a as right. right. Okay. They, That's they, what they, I'm asking. Right. Okay. Okay. Now I know 
this committee has in the past, when buildings come to us, I have heard this committee ask about loading zones and other things. But um, so it's not like we're not doing it. I don't know how far since what happened tonight, I don't know how much further we can go. Can we demand that they put this in? I'm just throwing it out there for the lack of better knowledge about it. Yeah. Drawings or anything else that we can do to kind of ensure that this won't happen again. The only reason why I went to approve it is because where else are they going to go? Where are the trucks going to go? And the garbage and everything else. But um, I don't know what else we can do, but maybe we should think about it. That's basically what I'm saying. No, I mean, yeah, this is, I think this all goes back to what I suggest for what, uh, what Bill Fenoy has, is that are the, do we have a, you know, maybe we could establish some kind of a small process. So as we, when we hear something, you know, they're not coming to us, but we hear about it, or, you know, we're, or let's say we're going down the uh, Flatbush Avenue or something like that, we'll say, what the heck is that? And we find out about it and we can bring it up, you know, at a, at a future meeting and perhaps say, oh, let's uh, let's contact big Mr. or Ms. Developer on Flatbush Avenue and find out what's, you know, and say, please contact us. Let us know what's going on. Or Just, could we work know, again, with a city a, agency who, where they will file their plans first, whether it's DOB well, or- they have to go to the Department of Buildings, yeah. They have to go to the Department of Buildings, so that's part of it. Yes, because you well, may not pass by all the buildings that's going up. If you yeah, want to use that I mean, that we don't method. know. They, they they have to go, but that doesn't mean the Department of Buildings necessarily has to come to us. But yeah, Brian. I'm, I'm... Sorry, it sounds like people were finishing up their comments. I just have one quick thing, Brian, if I can. Um, I'm sorry, Taya, but Rob Paris used to circulate all the permits filed. Um, in the district for new construction a long time ago. It stopped a long time ago. I, and with the new DOB now system, I'm not sure how easy or difficult this might be, but is that something that we can look into at least getting notification when permits are filed for new construction in the district? Sorry, Brian. No, I think it's a good, it's a, it is a good idea. Again, you know, how do we get, can we get the DOB to, or can we get the, let's say, the Brooklyn commissioner to give us this information uh, for uh, perhaps, that's something, again, that's part of uh, trying to get more info before these things come to us. I think this is part of all of this idea that Bill Fenoy had. Uh, okay, let me go back to Brian and then over to Yvette. Yeah, I mean, I, I I won't claim to be an expert on how 600, nearly 600 units of uh, housing, you know, dispose of their garbage. Uh, certainly, it needs to be placed in some room before it can be even loaded onto the trucks. But I, it, it it seems like right, the city is 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 testing all these different pilots about how to do residential trash collection. I think most of them are not nearly the scale that we are talking about, but there are certainly ways that trash could be, you know, stored or collected that that don't require uh, this particular solution. Um, I, I'm not, I'm not, you know, it, it may have been the case that like the other solutions that are currently accepted are, would would also be poor decisions. There are poor choices, um, but. It just it, it it does not seem like we were uh, considering you know you know that's not really the job of, of our of our committee um, but it didn't seem like we were necessarily as forced into a corner as as it as it may have been said. Thank you. It is it's difficult. Yeah, it is a tricky area for us. Um, I guess I said last, okay. Oh, let me just go to Yvette. I promise you that. You promise me. <laughs> Thank you. I, um, <laughs> I, I'm almost of the opinion that that loading dock is a result of a traffic study that was done too late for that building. It was an afterthought. Ms. Richardson is correct, as she often is. 
they did a traffic study and they were like, oh, you can't have all this. What, how are you doing this? And they were like, oh, we got to put a loading dock in, right? Um, and it's actually a little frustrating because those are like some high power architects and stuff and attorneys that are on this job. And, um, but outside of that, I think um, when you see a building going up or when it's already, the permits are already at the Department of Buildings, it's almost a little too late. I don't know the city charter, quite honestly, in our bylaws enough to understand if we could just approach people because they buy property, right? Is that really like, yeah. I mean, they'd have the right to do that, right? They have a right mm -hmm. to develop as of right. I mean, I don't know if there's an ad hoc Friends of Community Board too that can maybe say, we're here, we wanna know about your project, right? <laughs> I mean, I don't know that's- an Yeah, option. no, that, again, that goes to sure. what, uh, Bill is, what Bill is suggesting. Yes. Yeah. That's, that's I think also, uh, for your point, I think the uh, they're trying to they're trying to use City Point as a model. Uh, yeah. City Point has Target in it, Trader Joe's, a whole bunch of stores, and it's a heck of a big place. It's a different and, landmass. Yeah, it's a different land, but they are just uh, it's not dissimilar in location <laughs> or shape. And the trucks do come on the side. They have a side well, piece. Yeah. It's yeah. like Willoughby. Is it on Willoughby? No, no, no. They're not on Willoughby. No, there it's uh the trucks are it's more like an extension from Fleet Place going in the towards, back, like uh, Bridge Street, Street or one of those. Yeah, going towards Fulton Street. And the trucks do uh go in and out of that little location over there for Target and for Trader and yeah, I, I pass by them and I, sometimes they'll have a guy as the trucks are coming out will come stop the traffic on Flatbush Avenue uh, and then the truck will come out and then they'll zoom down Flatbush Avenue the traffic resumes. So I think that's where that I think that's where that's my feeling that where they got that I you know why they picked the Calb Avenue as the side. Yeah, but anyway. the thing is, Gordon, those trucks can actually pull in all the way in, and there's an entire garage below yes. the level, ground level, where they can actually unload. They're not parked. That's true, right? too, also. Yeah, I mean, they can actually go in and turn around and come back out. It's that large. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, Daughtry? Thanks. Um, I do have a couple of relevant things. I could talk about this kind of stuff all night, but I won't spare us all. <laughs> yeah, I think I, I, um, I think we want to uh, just wrap it up quick. I'm going to wrap it up real uh, quick. I just want to give a quick update. Yeah. Um, you may have seen that Council Member Hudson released yeah. an invitation to invite people in her community district to talk about land use planning proactively. Yeah. Oh, my God. So I said, yeah, hey, good. Lincoln. Why, you know, this is my district is 33. Where's our mm -hmm. land use plan proactive meeting? And Arvin responded and said they are doing one, but it's focused mostly in, in Williamsburg and Greenpoint. So I just as an FYI, there are some conversations starting to be more proactive. I'm not sure where Crystal's going with that, but I just wanted to let you guys know that. And then just a quick update on um, the Atlantic use, um, mixed use planning working group. I was out of town for the um, public, the uh, open house they had last Sunday, but it sounded like it was very positive. Um, from the working group debrief that I did attend on Monday, it sounds like there's some um, expectation reigning in that needs to happen, which I'm not surprised about. And um, now I'm going to editorialize and just tell you, um, mm -hmm. I got a little bit frustrated because that whole process they're doing, you know, invited all of us, including us in community board two, as well as mostly community board eight, to talk about revisioning, envisioning the whole corridor up and down Atlantic Avenue, um, not just about land use, but also about education, um, economic development, and also infrastructure, safety, and all that. But they're kind of handcuffing it because they're saying it has to be as of right. So in other words, they're not entertaining rezoning even though they've asked the community to tell them what is needed. And in my opinion, what is needed can't necessarily easily be accommodated by the as of right, right? So they're trying to 
and then in the meantime, you know, we had our conversations with Eds and Meds, and we asked a lot of questions about how are the guidelines going to be implemented if there's not, if you're not saying that they're trying to rezone over there. So there's a lot of discussions going on, and I'm not totally clear how it's going to pan out, but I just wanted to share that with you. There are more public meetings happening for the Atlantic Avenue um, mixed use plan. So I encourage you, if you've got the capacity, to maybe try to tune in because um, I think we could use some smart people and there's a lot of smart people here. So thanks. Okay, uh, let's wrap it up with Esther. You know, Taya sent out um, invitation for us to go to training, parliamentary procedure training. I went last night. It was about the motions and amendments. And basically at that training, they said that the committee should make a motion first after somebody presents, make a motion, then discuss it, and then, you know, move on because otherwise you mm -hmm. take too long. I'm just telling you what they said. They act like this is a yeah. rules and regulation. I think right. that um, the next meeting, if you want to go to the motion and amendment meeting is at April 27th, the same day that Georgia had at 630. They also want to have other meetings. Um, Taya sent this email April 13th, if you want to look at it. That's it. Okay. All right, Brian, you got the last word, and now just... Uh... Uh, just just mentioning, uh, I put the, the time for the next Atlantic Avenue Mixed Use Plan uh, meeting in the chat. Okay, thank you, Brian. All right, I think we've discussed just about everything. Uh, we've hit all the points. Motion to conclude or wrap up our meeting. Motion to adjourn. Adjourn, all right. Second. Uh, second. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, everybody. I think we got you everything.